Are we up? I guess so. It's 3.50. I think we should start. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2022 Missouri Law Review Symposium. This year, uh, generously co-sponsored by the University of Missouri Kinder Institute for Constitutional Democracy. Our talk is impeachments of Donald Trump. Before I get to a couple of preliminary remarks, you mentioned here in central Missouri, we are going through what for the Midwest amounts to some sort of apocalypse, which essentially followed by a little bit of ice, some snow, and consequence of which um, the uh, university has shut itself down. The symposium, of course, is going to go on as scheduled, as we've all learned to do throughout the COVID period do it virtually. So although we won't be doing anything at all from the university, we're going to be uh, proceeding very much as scheduled with the regrettable exception that we won't be able to have an in-person watching room today and I think probably tomorrow. Uh, but otherwise, everything is just as it was. So let me begin by offering thanks to some of those folks who made this event possible. First, a thank you, thank you to Associate Dean Paul Litton, who in addition to any other uh, jobs in his portfolio is charged with hunting up faculty members, perfect law review students in conceiving the symposium highlight our academic year. I still carry the scars of the beatings uh, that Paul inflicted on me to lend a hand with this one. Uh, next, of course, uh, we members of the Missouri Law Review itself, who have not only had many hours uh, setting up the presentations you're going to hear today and tomorrow, but are going to invest lots more hours in editing the written, written submissions that many of our speakers are going to make to the dedicated issue of the law review uh, will uh, uh, result from this. Thanks in particular uh, to Mackenzie Stout, the editor-in-chief of the 21-22 uh, Law Review. And I want to thank most especially Associate Editor-in-Chief uh, Gunnar Johansson, who has led the Law Review Symposium team uh, with, with amazing energy. Um, uh, the law school is also grateful to be sharing sponsorship of the symposium with uh, the university's Kinder Institute for Constitutional Democracy. And special thanks go to Dr. Justin Dyer, director of the institute. In addition um, to supporting the symposium generally, is going to be moderating its second panel tomorrow morning. In addition, Professor Tommy Bennett, uh, who is both a young star of our faculty here at the law school and a fellow at the Kinder Institute, institute is going to be moderating another panel. Uh, thanks also to our fearless leader here at the law school, Dean Larissa Litsky, for his support of this and all the other journal symposia, uh, as well as her support of all the other events that make up the intellectual life of the law school outside of its classrooms. Finally, I want to thank in advance all of the remarkably distinguished speakers you're going to hear over the next day and a half. I think it's fair to say that this gathering is one of the two most distinguished academic groups ever assembled and a single event to discuss, discuss presidential impeachment. The only event that I know of that offered a comparable breadth of knowledge and intellectual fire, firepower was the hearing on the background and history of impeachment held 24 years ago on November 9th of 1998 by the House Judiciary Committee during its deliberations on the Clinton impeachment. That day, 19 scholars came down to Congress and testified live and others provided written analysis. Indeed, we have several living links to that proceeding with us in this symposium. Professor Michael Gerhardt uh, testified live in the Clinton hearing, as he also would do in the uh, Trump impeachment. Peter Baker, the chief White House correspondent of the New York Times, uh, covered the Clinton impeachment and later wrote about it in two books. I and a colleague submitted some written testimony to the Judiciary Committee, which you'll find way in the back of the written record um, among the, the smaller people. Um, as for the group that you're going to hear over the next two days, everyone played a role in either the national debate over the two Trump impeachments or in the work of Congress itself, and sometimes both. You'll hear more details about this as the event unfolds, but consider only today's panel and our keynote speaker. Our panel on the Trump impeachments in historical perspective begins with Brenda Wineapple, a distinguished historian and author of the Impeachers, The Trial of Andrew Johnson and the Dream of a Just Nation. It was published in 2019, just as impeachment became a real prospect for President Trump. As a study of the what was one of the only then two prior full and pre, uh, presidential impeachment proceedings, 
The book was immensely influential throughout both of the Trump cases. Also on the first panel is Peter Baker, who is a scintillating career with the Times um, and the Washington Post, covering presidents generally and presidential impeachment in particular I've already sketched. We're delighted to round out the first panel with Joshua Matz, who co-authored with legendary constitutional scholar, scholar Lawrence Tribe, the extremely influential 2018 book on impeachment presidency. And Mr. Matz went on to serve as counsel to the House Judiciary during both Trump impeachments. Finally tonight, our keynote speaker will be Congressman Jamie, Jamie Raskin, uh, himself a former law professor at the American University, who served on the House Judiciary Committee during the first Trump impeachment and became the lead house manager during the second one. A boatload of folks of similar distinction are on tap for tomorrow. Now, a word on who you won't see. Uh, the view that President Trump should not have been impeached at all on either occasion, or that both impeachments were somehow uh, unjustifiable witch hunts is not going to be represented here. One of the most obvious distinctions between this gathering and, for example, the Judiciary Committee hearings on the Clinton impeachment is that in Clinton, there was a wide divergence of opinion uh, within the legal and historical community about both the constitutional validity and the desirability of impeaching President Clinton. Plenty of eminent scholars could be found on both sides and rafts of them press their competing views loudly in scholarly journals, in the press, and before Congress. There was, um, I think I can say fairly, no such division about President Trump. I think it's fair to say that fewer than a single handful of academics, at least, actively defended President Trump in both impeachments. And among that handful, uh, the most publicly visible, uh, unfortunately, had transparently reversed themselves on positions they'd taken during the deba debates over Clinton, or failed to advance constitutionally, constitutionally credible arguments, or both. However, um, during both Trump impeachments, there were distinguished constitutional scholars who did articulate serious constitutional reservations about one or more of the articles of impeachment against President Trump, or about the procedures employed in one or the other of this, these impeachments. And we are pleased that several of those are among our distinguished guests. For example, we are honored to have with us the uh, genuine constitutional heavyweight, Professor Michael McConnell, formerly a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, now uh, on the Stanford Law Faculty. Um, in his recent book on the presidency, President or Professor McConnell expressed serious reservations about the constitutional propriety of impeaching a president for resisting um, congressional investigative demands, which was, after all, the basis of the second article of the first Trump impeachment. Likewise, we're equally honored to have tomorrow Professor Philip Bobbitt of both the Columbia and University of Texas law schools, who recently received an honorary knighthood from Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth for his intellectual contributions to the United Kingdom and to Anglo-American law generally. Professor Bobbitt argued at the time of the second Trump impeachment that the Constitution does not permit a Senate trial of a president who's left office. Now, as it happens, I and perhaps some other speakers that you hear from over the next two days disagree with Professors McConnell and Professor, and Professor Bobbitt on both points. But the objective of this symposium is to explore disagreements like that, as well as the many points of agreement, fully and fairly and dispassionately and intelligently. I should add that we wanted to provide a voice here uh, for those who oppose both impeachments. So the Law Review invited uh, both of Missouri senators, Senator Roy Blunt and Senator Josh Hawley, who was formerly a professor at this law school, uh, in the hope that they would be willing to discuss their votes to acquit in both cases. Sadly, neither accepted those invitations. Let me uh, now offer some very brief uh, opening thoughts on the topic of this symposium. As I'll discuss in greater, greater detail here in a moment on the first panel, impeachment's a very old mechanism. It was invented by the English Parliament all the way back in 1376, migrated to the New World when Britain settled, settled North America, and a special variant of it was written into the U.S. Constitution. Over the centuries, it served a number of functions. For example, its most common use uh, in American national government has been as a kind of house cleaning measure, enabling us to sweep or grievously incompetent federal judges out of their life tenured offices. But its most important use has always been as a tool for the legislature to restrain an executive who threatens constitutional order or the well being of the country, a king, a queen, or the United States president. In Great Britain, uh, impeachment was never available to, uh, to remove the monarch. Um, 
Rather, it constrained royal power by removing the crown's great servants and ministers through whom royal power was exercised. By contrast, the framers of the U.S. Constitution uh, wrote impeachment into the document primarily to create a mechanism for removing the chief, chief executive by means other than electoral defeat. The framers seemingly invited um, the re fairly regular use of impeachment. First, by limiting the consequences of a successful impeachment to removal of, from office, and in extreme cases, a bar from future office holding. And second, by making the standard of impeachable behavior both opaque and elastic, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, whatever those are. On the other hand, they raised what has so far proven to be, to be an essentially insurmountable procedural barrier to conviction, at least of presidents, that is to say the requirement of a two-third vote in the Senate. In this symposium, uh, we're going to address, I expect, either expressly or by inference, a number of questions, including what is impeachment's proper purpose or purposes, at least in the case of presidents? Has it ever served that function or functions? Was it properly employed against President Trump either time? Uh, even though President Trump was not convicted, removed, or barred from federal service in either case, did impeachment serve a useful function in either case? If conviction could not be obtained against President Trump on the facts presented in the two cases against him, does impeachment have any continued utility? And if so, what is it? Next, Democrats, if we look back, framed the Clinton impeachment as a purely partisan exercise. A great many Republicans uh, now maintain that the Trump impeachments were purely partisan exercises. Are we now at risk of regular future retaliatory impeachments on dubious grounds? Finally, in my view, impeachment is at bottom a tool of constitutional self-defense. It's the only way to remove a dangerous president between elections. And the only way to remove a sitting president who actively threatens the integrity of the electoral process, which is the primary vehicle by which he is supposed to be checked under our constitution. In the current political environment, it seems extremely doubtful that impeachment can work as the fail-safe defense against executive tyranny that I at least think it was designed to be. If that assessment is right, can any changes realistically be made to restore the vitality of impeachment? And if the answer to that question is maybe not, or a definite no, what alternative mechanism, constitutional or otherwise, now exist or might be created to address a would-be autocrat in the White House? I'm looking forward to listening and learning from all of our terrific guests. I hope you are as well. And before we start that, uh, let me turn this over to the editor-in-chief of the Law Review, Kansas South. Thank you, Professor Bowman. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank everyone for being here with us today and for those who will tune in tomorrow. My name is Mackenzie Stout and I am the current editor-in-chief of the Missouri Law Review. As Professor Bowman mentioned, our law review has worked extremely hard to bring this event to you all today and tomorrow. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Gunnar Johansson. He is our associate editor-in-chief who truly led the charge on this um, symposium to plan, organize, and execute this event. We are honored to have such esteemed speakers and moderators with us today and tomorrow. I want to thank each of the speakers, the moderators, and each of you in the audience for dedicating time to tune in to these very interesting discussions. After this symposium, our speakers will be writing articles which will be published in our summer issue of the Missouri Law Review 87.3. The issue will go to print in early October 2022, and you can access the Law Review issues by subscribing to our journal accessing it on the Law Review website, or finding it on Lexis and Westlaw. Once again, thank you all for being here. And without further ado, we will go ahead and turn it over for our first panel. Okay. Well, hello, folks. There you are. Here we uh, are. All, all nice and safe and warm, I trust. I'm looking out the back window of the house and the snow is blowing through the trees, and, um, we're, we're, but we're, we're staying safe and warm. So uh, thank you so much for all of you uh, being with us uh, virtually, uh, though you are, uh, but um, we're really looking forward to having an opportunity to, to hear from such distinguished folks. Um, so let me begin um, with a little bit of an introduction of you 
And as I promised, a little bit of an introduction to the historical background of the institution of impeachment, and then turn it over to you and let me just sit back and, and, uh, and be amazed. Uh, so to start, in his one term of office, Donald Trump made history by becoming the first American president, indeed, I think, the first government official to be impeached twice. He was, of course, also acquitted twice, which, while also a first, was not inconsistent with historical practice in as much as no impeached president, president's ever been convicted. Understanding Trump's impeachments and his acquittals and trying to figure out what they mean for the future of the American presidency and American constitutional government requires, I think, knowing a good deal of history and placing the Trump impeachments in historical context is at least the primary subject of this panel. And we've assembled a really scintillating crew. Um, let me uh, introduce you all before uh, before you get um, First of all, we have um, Brenda Wineapple. Uh, Brenda is one of America's most nonfiction authors. Her uh, work includes multiple award-winning books, literary criticism and essays. You know, she regularly contributes to the New York Times Book Review and the New York Review of Books and teaches in the NFA, MFA program at Columbia University. Uh, what especially brings, us to, uh, brings her to us today is her most recent book on the subject of The Impeachers, The Trial of Andrew Johnson and the Dream of a Just Nation, which was selected by the, a, a, one New York Times critic as one of the 10 best books of 2019 and also listed as a New York Times 100 notable books of 2019. Uh, most critically, for today's purposes, it was read and studied by many of the protagonists and combatants in the two Trump impeachment battles. Uh, next, uh, we're uh, delighted to have with us Peter Baker, Chief White House Correspondent of the New York Times and a political analyst uh, for MSNBC. He's covered the last five presidents for the Times and the Washington Post. Um, and uh, he co-wrote the first story, Breaking the Ken Starr Investigation in the Post, and has covered all three impeachment battles of the last quarter century. He's the author of not one, but two books uh, relating to impeachment, both of them covering the Clinton impeachment, um, The Breach, Inside the Impeachment and Trial of William Jefferson Clinton, and he's the co-author of Impeachment in American History. He and his wife, Susan Glasser of The New Yorker, are writing on a, uh, working on a book on Donald Trump. And finally, uh, Joshua Matz. Um, Joshua's a partner, Kaplan, Hecker, and Fink, his practice includes complex commercial disputes, constitutional and civil rights law, and Supreme Court and appellate litigation. He's been involved, I must say, in a remarkable number of high-profile matters over the past few years. He's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law Center. In 2021, he was recognized by the American Lawyer as a Young Lawyer of the Year. In May 2018, he and the constitutional great Larry Tribe published their second book together, uh, there on the screen to end a presidency, the power of impeachment. In February 2021, um, he uh, took leave of absence from his firm to serve as impeachment counsel to the House Judiciary Committee uh, for the first uh, impeachment, uh, for the second impeachment trial, and he had previously been on counsel to the House Judiciary Committee for the first impeachment and trial of President Trump. And as somebody working under the hood, if you will, of both Trump impeachments, he has a unique perspective on the subject of this symposium. Um, so before I, but before I turn the, this panel over to these incredibly brilliant and learned folks, um, uh, since I too have inflicted a book about impeachment on a weary public, um, I've agreed to provide a whirlwind tour of the history of impeachment uh, up through 1788 when the American Constitution with its impeachment provisions was ratified. So here goes. Impeachment was a British invention. In the 14th century, Parliament was slowly developing into a recognizable legislature, representing the interests of the power centers in the society other than the king, that is to say, power centers like the hereditary aristocracy, the landed gentry, the merchants, the artisans, the traders of the towns, uh, the clergy, the men of law, and Parliament needed tools to resist royal overreach. The monarchy being both hereditary and for life, Parliament could legally remove a king of whom it disapproved. Removal was altogether impossible, absent assassination or war. But Parliament recognized that even kings can do nothing alone. They require others to do things on their behalf. If the king's servants, his royal ministers and favorites, could be removed, 
then the king could be restrained without the dangerous inconvenience of regicide or rebellion. So in 1376, Parliament invented impeachment. Fairly quickly, at least in historical terms, it assumed the form we immediately recognize today. The lower, lower house of the legislature in England, the House of Commons, impeached by voting to approve charges. A select group of, the member, of members of the lower house became managers who presented the charges to the upper house, who in England are the House of Lords, in a trial. If the Lords convicted, the accused could not only be re removed from office, but critically, uh, in England, they could also be imprisoned, banished, fined, disinherited, or even executed. Impeachment from its beginning seven centuries ago has always been, at least in my view, a political tool. By far, its most important function has been as a mechanism used in extreme cases by the legislative branch to control executive branch absolutism. However, the impeachment process with which the framers of the American Constitution were very familiar also had aspects of a criminal proceeding. That is, it employed the forms of a criminal prosecution with formal charges and the presentation of evidence at a thing that looked like a trial. And it could result in punishments which extended beyond simple expulsion from office to the same kinds of things that the state could do with you or to you if you were convicted of a serious crime like robbery or murder. Now, Parliament also created other tools to deal with its political enemies. And sometimes there was the Crown, particularly something called the Bill of Attainder, which allowed the legislature to pass a bill imposing the same sort of grievous punishments that could follow impeachment or conviction in criminal courts without the prerequisite of any trial proving any specific wrongdoing. Um, when uh, the American framers, uh, however, uh, wrote the American Constitution, uh, they made a series of choices and assumptions. First, they chose a federal model of nationhood, a union of states under a national government of limited powers. Second, they created a national government of three separate and mutually checking branches. Third, they rejected monarchy of any kind, but realized the need for an active executive, whom they called a president. Fourth, they assumed the legislature would naturally be the strongest branch and that the presidency would be relatively weak. Fifth, they nonetheless recognized that their assumptions uh, about the weakness of the presidency might prove wrong uh, as the country evolved, and therefore that a manifestly incompetent, corrupt, or autocratic president could pose a serious risk to the nation. Sixth, they were particularly afraid of a personality type that they recognized from their study of classical antiquity, demagogues, men who craved power for its own sake and who gained it and kept it by dishonest appeals to popular passions. To protect the Republic against demagogic would-be dictator presidents and, and dangerously corrupt or incompetent presidents generally, uh, the framers erected three basic protections. The first was presidential elections, which they thought would be the main one, which the framers envisioned as screening out unworthy candidates from ever assuming office and as a mechanism for evicting poorly performing incumbents. But the framers didn't trust the masses to select presidents directly, as we know, and they wanted states uh, to play an intermediate role in that selection. The electoral college that most of us have come to deplore, or at least many of us have, was designed to place the presidential choice in the hands of a sober body of political figures chosen by the leadership class in each state that would naturally reject any obviously dangerous or unfit aspirant to the presidency. On the other hand, if the electoral college failed to produce a majority for one candidate, as some framers anticipated it would, uh, quite routinely, then the choice would go to Congress yet another body of ostensibly sober statesmen who would, of course, reject any obvious misfit. Second, if a really bad apple should nonetheless become president, the framers' real reliance, I think, was on the institutional checks and balances on the office of president, the president that we all learned about in high school. Notably, in our system, the president can, in theory, do very little without at least the passive acquiescence of Congress, even after the 20th, 20th century uh, engorgement uh, of the executive branch into a massive regulatory behemoth, uh, Congress ret retains the plain constitutional authority, if it chooses to use it, to stop, start, or restrain virtually all of it, and in doing so, constraining the president. The framers assumed, I think, that members of Congress would act in their institutional self-interest and fight ferociously 
any effort by presidents to siphon away the institutional power of Congress, and thus the members' personal power over government. Likewise, the framers, uh, though they were a hard-headed bunch with considerable hard-won skepticism about political man, also assume, I think, at least an irreducible minimum of public virtue in at least the majority of those who would serve in Congress. They assume that solid majorities of Congress would turn against any president whose corruption or incompetence or autocratic urges posed real dangers to the national welfare. Accordingly, the framers bestowed on Congress a final fallback, break the glass in case of emergency tool for use if all else failed and a truly bad president assumed office and began acting in ways that genuinely threatened national security, the rule of law, or the constitutional order. That rule, inherited from British practice, was impeachment. It's essential to understand that although the framers adopted important aspects of Great Britain's impeachment practice, they modified it significantly. First, uh, the framers copied the British in leaving the impeachment process in the hands of the national legislature. They did not, for example, confer the power to try impeachments on the judiciary, as some suggested at the time. Now, key, it says to me that impeachment is at bottom a political remedy delegated to a political body to address political dangers. Second, uh, they made impeachment applicable to the chief executive, not just his underlings. Presidents, unlike kings, can be Third, the framers limited the possible consequences of conviction by the Senate. Unlike in Britain, where Parliament could impose all the penalties of criminal law, conviction by the Senate produces only mandatory removal from current office and the possibility of a permanent ban from future office. Fourth, at the same time the framers embraced impeachment, their constitution barred ex post facto laws by which a legislature could criminalize conduct retrospectively and also eliminated bills of attainder with which parliament could condemn someone without a trial. As a result, an American official who is impeached and convicted can in theory be convicted of crimes and sentenced to criminal penalties for the behavior that got him impeached, but that can only happen after an entirely separate proceeding in an ordinary court of law. Uh, one editorial aside on penalties here, the British parliament sometimes authorized the severe penalties of imprisonment, impoverishment, and even death for impeachment, um, not simply because they were bloody-minded folks. Rather, the men they impeached were often rich, powerful, landed in favor with the crown, and sometimes possessed of their own military resources. Just throwing them out of office did not necessarily neuter them or eliminate the danger that they would return to power uh, and strike back at those in parliament who condemned them. Imprisonment, imprisonment, exile, impoverishment, or execution were sometimes considered necessary means of taking them off the political board. The American framers, I think, wanted to eliminate that sort of savage legislative preemptive strike, but they were acutely alive to the possibility that some public figures, most importantly the demagogues they feared so much, would pose a continuing danger unless barred from ever holding office again. Thus, it's critical to see the disqualification penalty not as a sort of a casual aside in the impeachment clauses of the Constitution, but as a key to understanding what the framers most feared and as a critical component of the remedy that they crafted. Um, fifth, uh, the framers decided to include a definition of impeachable conduct uh, in the constitutional text. In its final form, of course, it became um, treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, oops, here we go. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Um, I could spend a long time talking about that, but I'm just the moderator here. So I'll leave that conversation uh, to our, our, our my distinguished colleagues. Um, uh, nonetheless, um, in fact, I think I'm just going to do that. Um, the last thing I want to say is before turning it over to my colleagues is to mention the final thing um, that uh, the framers did, which is although they inserted a, a definition of in, you know, impeachable conduct into the Constitution, that was uh, both opaque and fairly elastic, and they conferred the power to impeach onto the, in, on the legislative branch, suggesting perhaps that they intended impeachment to be used a fairly, a fairly large amount. They also erected uh, a really towering bower, uh, barrier to action, that is the requirement of a two-thirds majority for conviction in the Senate. So with that rapid motion through 
several hundred years of uh, Anglo-American history. I want to turn to our panelists to discuss how the framers design has worked out in the ensuing 230 some years. And let me begin uh, by turning to um, Brenda Wineapple. Brenda, you're on. Well, thank you. Thanks, Frank. Um, I feel, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit like a fish out of water here um, with so many wonderful constitutional scholars and people like yourself who are so immersed in the history of impeachment. So what I'm gonna do besides thank you for inviting me is to focus um, on the Andrew Johnson impeachment of 1868, because I'm going to assume that most people in the audience know very, very little about it. Um, and that assumption comes from the fact, um, even though it sounds a little solipsistic, that I knew very little about it. And knowing quite a bit about American history and literature, I began to wonder why it was that I knew so little about it and why <clears throat> it was that it had been for so long uh, dismissed as a political, and in that sense, um, political meaning a very bad uh, uh, enterprise uh, uh, inaugurated by a group of fanatics that were called radical Republic, re Republicans. And so I, when I started to look at it, it seemed to me odd because of a couple of things um, that were unusual in American history, it wasn't that long at the time. One was that the country uh, in 1868 was still reeling from the first ever assassination of an American president, Abraham Lincoln. It was also reeling from a civil war which left more than 750,000 men, women, children, probably even more uh, dead. And that also, and it's no insignificant thing, freed 4 million enslaved people. And the fact that the country was going to face another impeachment was something I thought extremely unusual and something that really couldn't and shouldn't be dismissed as, as embarrassing or forgettable or partisan, which it seemed largely um, Peter's work and Joshua's work and your work notwithstanding to have been done um, partly really because that's what JFK did in Profiles and Courage. If anybody knew anything about Andrew Johnson's impeachment, they knew that there was a chapter on it in Profiles and Courage, very popular book, won a Pulitzer Prize, may not even have been written by Kennedy. But in that particular chapter, what it said was that the person, the deciding vote, a man named Edmund Ross, on the deciding vote to acquit Andrew Johnson um, was itself a courageous act because he went against the, um, the wishes of his party. And uh, that's itself an arguable uh, point to make what Kennedy or uh, Theodore Sorensen were doing was kind of ignoring the fact that uh, this man Ross was probably bribed or at least uh, he got quite a bit of quid pro quo Term that we've become very familiar with for his uh, vote. It was and it is not my intention to talk, even though this is the subject of our uh, conference and symposium here, uh, about the similarities or differences between Andrew Johnson and Donald Trump. They're pretty egregious and they're pretty obvious just at the surface. For one thing, Andrew Johnson was a populist and some called him a demagogue um, who very much liked to take his uh, case directly to the people. He felt that if he could appeal to the people um, that he would always be fine and be able to do what he wanted. And so he would uh, engineer noisy crowds uh, during which uh, he would say that his enemies shouldn't just be locked up, they actually uh, should be uh, hanged. Um, those enemies included anyone who opposed his commitment, and this is really, I think, singularly important, to maintaining uh, what he considered to be a white man's government. And he was quoted several times as saying 
this is a country for white men and by God, as long as I am president, it shall be a government for white men. And while many people thought that him saying this right after the war and the fact that um, he seemed so uh, intent on persecuting his enemies um, that he was, to use the uh, contemporary phrase, unhinged or more to the point that he was a drunk in order to talk uh, the way he did. Um, so those were, those, and, and also I suppose from a psychological point of view, one of the also, one of the interesting um, commonalities that he has in, with the recent presidents um, is the fact that uh, he was, um, he, he felt himself always to be a victim. He felt himself to be persecuted. In fact, um, when Frederick Douglass, um, the formerly enslaved and eloquent abolitionist, uh, called on Johnson uh, with a group of black men uh, wanting, uh, demanding uh, the vote, we who carried bullets should be able to have ballots. Um, Johnson went on to say that nobody suffered more than he was. He's talking to a group of formerly enslaved people. Some of this is absolutely unthinkable. It's also interesting too to note, and I always find this fascinating, that Johnson, uh, like Donald Trump, was coming to the end of his term. There was an election uh, looming uh, on the horizon. And so many people really did not want to impeach Johnson because they figured he could get the get him out of office very soon. Um, but the issues were really too powerful, too important, too significant, and really had to do with the, the direction that the country was going to take because the country was indeed at a crossroads and that Congress felt that Johnson had usurped the power and prerogatives that belonged to them, particularly because they claimed that they had the power, not the president, to reconstruct the southern states or readmit them to the union. So you have to remember the context, and this is very different. There was a civil war, and there were 11 of formerly Confederate states um, that were not part of the Union uh, after that particular war. And what was felt very strongly was that Johnson was squandering the Union's recent victory by restoring, which is what he did, former rebels to power. And so he took on himself the reconstruction of these particular states and tried to readmit them to Congress when, in fact, Congress has the power to decide the terms of its own membership. And that seemed really a usurpation right there. Moreover, um, he began uh, not only to, um, to behave in this way, but he was vetoing all kinds of civil rights uh, legislation. Um, and in fact, he vetoed the first civil rights bill in Congress, overrode the veto, which was the first time Congress ever overrode a veto. Um, when, when his doing, Johnson's doing, or taking these kinds of actions, had very dire consequences because, after all, as I mentioned, there were four million formerly enslaved people, uh, and by reconstructing the South along the lines um, of what it had been before the war, uh, he was actually fomenting massacres of Black people in places like Memphis and New Orleans, um, and also just on the streets and sidewalks of many places in the South. Congress did not want to impeach this particular president because as I said, it was a very tenuous time in the history of the country. There had been assassination, there had been a war, and um, people wanted to put all of this aside and heal the country, but at the same time ensure that the rights of the formerly enslaved were protected. Um, so what they did was pass the 14th Amendment, which would enshrine 
um, civil rights and citizenship within the Constitution, regardless of the color or condition of previous servitude. Johnson, again, went on the stump uh, campaigning against the ratification of this particular uh, amendment. Um, there were three attempts, two of which were unsuccessful uh, to impeach Johnson. And as I said, impeachment was considered a bridge too far. Um, and because, especially because, in spite of, they didn't have Frank with them, so in spite of what Frank was laying out for us, the country itself and even people in Congress really didn't know what impeachment entailed because the Constitution and the Federalist Papers could be read in several ways. And what they had to decide was whether the president had to commit specifically illegal acts and then uh, which were demonstrably impeachment, uh, impeachable, sorry. Um, and that was, a, that, that was a real question. Does a, does a president have to commit, does, does impeachment require, in other words, a criminal offense, a breaking of the law? And what kind of breaking of the law? One, one congressman said, does that mean stealing a chicken is an impeachable offense? Or does it have to be something like not just high crimes and misdemeanors, high crimes and high misdemeanors? Stealing a chicken, I assume, is a, is a, is a misdemeanor. So these are really very interesting questions. Or is an abuse of power, which is not a specifically criminal act, is that, is that sufficient for impeachment? Is subversion of Congress and a failure to execute the laws of the people, is that impeachable? Should, in other words, deplorable, bigoted, or reckless act be considered impeachable, particularly if they do flout other branches of government? It's really very difficult, and people didn't want to, um, didn't want to, encounter this. Thaddeus Stevens, who became one of the impeachment managers, congressman from Pennsylvania and a radical Republican and proud of it, did say, along with what Frank just said, that actually that it's not necessary to prove that the crime committed by or the so-called crime committed by a, a president is an indictable offense because he said it's a purely political proceeding. That's, by the way, why, in fact, it was dismissed for many, many years, because it was assumed political means partisan. The, just, to, just to get back into the historical weeds for a second, Congress could not curtail Andrew Johnson. It tried with the 14th Amendment. It tried with civil rights legislation. It tried with keeping the Freedmen's Bureau um, uh, uh, funded. It tried uh, with three Reconstruction Acts, which divided the South into various areas uh, that would be overseen by the military, and it gave black men the vote in that particular case. And in order to protect the black men uh, at the polls, the army was involved. And in order to protect the army, the Secretary of War had to be involved. And so what Congress did was pass something called the Tenure of Office Act, 1867, to protect Edwin Stanton, who was the Secretary of War. And they did all of this to stop Johnson from firing Stanton, who had become a radical Republican, because Stanton was protecting the military, who were protecting uh, black men going to the polls. What did Johnson do? To make a longer story short, um, he did not want black men voting. He did not want black men enfranchised in the, in the South, which Congress had mandated. He was thinking of his own political interests, by the way, and his own election, kind of like Trump uh, and Ukraine. Um, and, and by the way, when Grant was elected in 68, it was black men voting that put him over the top. But that's just as an aside. When, when, Johnson violated the Tenure of Office Act. The House could not, uh, they, they couldn't dilly-dally anymore. They couldn't, they couldn't debate anymore. 
they couldn't turn away anymore. They devoted over, voted overwhelmingly to impeach and Andrew Johnson. Then came the trial. <laughs> That's another story. The trial is overseen by the chief justice. The chief justice was a man named Salmon Chase. He wanted to be president. Here's where politics really comes into play. Because if Johnson was removed from office because he'd been Lincoln's vice president, the next in line was a man named Benjamin Wade in the Senate at the time, Ohio senator who's a radical Republican. Everyone was so afraid of Ben Wade. They were afraid that he might put Susan B. Anthony in the, in the cabinet. So they definitely didn't want Ben Wade in the House. And they had Grant waiting in the wings because when Johnson fired Stanton, Grant was supposed to take over. And Grant was really angry at Johnson for putting him in that position. So everybody had a dog in the fight, if you will. And then we get to the impeachment, the impeachment um, articles, the articles of impeachment, which were very complicated and very legalistic, with all due respect to all the lawyers here. And what that did, in a sense, is argue on the head of a pen whether or not the Tenure of Office Act was constitutional, whether or not Johnson was testing the constitutionality of the law. Um, the only two articles that were not legalistic really, in a sense, were kitchen sink articles that basically said that Johnson abused his power, that he abused Congress, uh, that he insulted it in the speeches that he made. Um, what I'm trying to say with that, with all that, with that, as I said, getting to detailed about really hap what happened um, is it, what happened in this context where the arguments which were really quite good on both sides was they were really focused around how we should understand impeachment, not just um, whether it's a legalistic term, it's a criminal uh, violation, um, or it's an abuse of power or maladministration, um, but whether there are moral issues involved. And here is where I think that um, we can come back to Trump in a, in a kind of backdoor way. Um, there are questions about what we know is or seems to be right and wrong when it rubs up against, when they rub up against philosophical and legal uh, questions. And these became moral questions. And the shock of recognition for me was that the question that was covertly argued at the impeachment trial and afterwards was what, what the obligation of Congress was to remove a person in high office who endangers men and women particularly the poor, the disenfranchised, the formerly enslaved, and in particular Johnson's case, doing so, um, removing him, really would set the stage for American history to go in a different direction. That is to say that I think that the best summary of the Johnson impeachment was made by the senator from Massachusetts, Charles Sumner, who said that the impeachment trial of Andrew Johnson it, it was not a legalistic affair. It wasn't even a political drama. He said, this is one of the last great battles with slavery. Because the way Sumner, the radical Republicans, and many alive at the time understood Johnson's impeachment was it was another way, another attempt to preserve the Union and to not just free the slave, which the war had done, but to maintain that freedom. Because those men, they were all men in Congress, who wanted Johnson impeached, uh, felt that preserving the Union 
and maintaining the freedom of the formerly enslaved were actually the same thing. And that in order to preserve the union and create a more perfect one, it had to be liberated at last from the noxious and lingering effects of an appalling institution that Johnson not only represented, but wanted to perpetuate. So that's, that's what I thought was so interesting about everything that we had been written in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, even up until the 1950s about Johnson's impeachment, is that this fundamentally moral and then political and then legal issue had been completely obscured. Um, and I think in that particular case, one of the ways perhaps later on, we can make a comparison between the Johnson impeachment and the two Trump impeachments, and particularly the second one, is that what is at stake and what was at stake was actually definitional, in that way, definition of the meaning of an American government. That's Thank what you. I have for you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brenda. Um, it looks like somehow, oh, there's Joshua. I thought we lost him. He's got a oh, fancier background now. Um, uh, uh, let me throw the... the uh, let me throw the, the, the floor open uh, to the other two of you, to Peter and Joshua, to either to make uh, any comments on uh, Brenda's presentation or to ask her any questions. I'd be happy to, to lead off with a comment, um, which is, you know, first of all, that I just greatly enjoyed that presentation, uh, much like I greatly enjoyed your book. And thank you so much for sharing that wisdom with us. You know, and I think part of what I thought was so special about your book was that it builds on really groundbreaking work by black and brown scholars in you know the late uh, in the late 20th century in particular Michael Benedict and Annette Gordon Reed and others who I think really recovered this narrative and this understanding that the Johnson impeachment was not you know it was not just essentially a, a binge of partisanship and it wasn't just that people went overboard in their efforts to get Johnson for political gain but that there was something existential at stake. And what was existentially, what that thing was, was fundamentally something about racism. And it was yeah. about the danger that Johnson and his policies posed and the risk that they would salt the earth and undo so much of what a civil war had just been fought to achieve. And that understanding, which in many ways I think was born of a white supremacist historiography from the late 19th century and persisted well into the 20th century. This understanding that all that was going on there was a bit too much partisanship and that the Johnson impeachment story could be reduced to that instead of everything that you and Gordon Reed and LeBenedict and others have, I think, recovered so effectively. Um, you know, that, that idea, I think, was sort of invidious because the way that we understand history and the way we talk about prior impeachments then becomes part of our own understanding of what impeachment is for today and when we should do it and when we shouldn't do it. You know, and Peter in his book I, and, and otherwise, you know, have, has written about the ways in which the idea of a partisan impeachment is so much a watchword of how we now talk about this. And for so long, Johnson was held up as what you shouldn't do. And I think what your work helps us rediscover is that in many ways, it's actually what you ought to do, that that was a justified impeachment, even if the technicalities of the charges were poorly formulated, and that the underlying need for judgment there about who we are and what we're doing as a country and what it would mean for the constitutional order to persevere are, are inescapable and can't get just reduced into a tally of how many people from one party vote one way and from the other party vote the other. Mm -hmm. you know, and and the, the only last point I'll make there is what gets lost in that story, it's just taken for granted that you know one political party voted in lockstep against the charges that had been presented by the House. And you know, for reasons that will be obvious given my role as a former impeachment counsel for the House, something that I find frustrating is there's often a sense that the political party that brought the impeachment bears some unique and singular obligation to not act in a partisan way. But there's two political parties mm -hmm. and members of the other political party are equally culpable for their decisions. And sometimes what it means to not have a political impeachment is for members that, for people that are otherwise sympathetic to the president to not vote in lockstep with their party, mm -hmm. as opposed to vice versa, which is I think the usual narrative. And so anyway, I, I think your work is just so brilliant at, at excavating these incredibly deep points about what impeachment is for and how we should understand it in our own time. 
thank you. May I make one comment? I, I think I have time to just make one comment. There's an irony in what you're saying, Josh. Not in all the compliment. There's no irony in that. that, that that's, that's, <laughs> I take that straight. I take my compliments straight. But, but in fact, um, the interesting thing about the Johnson impeachment was that um, that seven members of the Republican Party, which is not for those listening, it's not the same Republican Party that were more or less switched in a certain way. Seven members of the Republican Party, and it was the Republicans who impeached uh, Andrew Johnson, and he was really, in a sense, had no party in a way. He had been a Democrat, and he really was part of his union party, but in any event, he was a Democrat. The seven members voted to acquit Johnson, which is so interesting. So they did not, they, that's what I mean, is the irony. The, the Democrats did vote in lockstep, one of whom was his son in law. Oh, um, but, but the Republicans didn't. They were called recusants. They were, they were vilified, you know, very often. And, and they had various reasons for, not, for voting to acquit, mainly, as I said, because they didn't want to rock the boat and they wanted Grant in there. So it's a, so it's a kind of irony when we're talking about, when we think that, um, when we're talking about Trump, we were thinking, oh, if only more Republicans had stood up and voted, particularly in the second impeachment, to impeach, it seemed unimpeachable. You know, the question seemed so obvious. But it was more complicated then. I'd also have to, I also want to just make one other comment because I think it's so important. And it has to do with money, alas. And there was a lot of money changing hands. So that there's the dirty little secret, once again, to impeachment is we can talk about the morality of the whole thing. And I certainly can talk about that ad nauseum. But there were there was a lot of money that was in, in going on in the in the back rooms. And one of the people who was organizing the bribes basically said, um, we had enough, but we could have had more. Both. So I don't know what happened in the recent past. I don't even know if I want to know what happened. But we we know that there there's a there's a there's an issue of money that's always involved. Thank you. Let me uh, thank you guys so much. And let me be, because unfortunately we have less time for this panel than I would very much like. Um, let me just turn right now to uh, Peter Baker and let him. Uh, I mean, if you want to start, Peter, by making any remarks about or, or, you know, what Brent's had to say or what Josh has had to say, please do. But if not, um, please uh, give us your pitch. <laughs> All right, good. Well, listen, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for including me. I feel like it's the old Sesame Street, uh, you know, song. One of these things is not like the other. I'm here with these great scholars and great writers who have um, studied impeachment for so long and know so much about the various cases. Uh, I love Brenda's book. It's fantastic. I love Frank's book and I love Josh's book too. So I'm a big, I'm not a scholar, but I am an impeachment geek. Uh, in fact, I just started reading this week for some reason. I'm not quite sure why Edmund Ross's book about the Johnson impeachment which he published 28 years after the, uh, the fact. Uh, and it's fascinating actually. And he makes some interesting arguments that we should we probably don't have time to get into that, but they're, that are interesting. Um, the difference, of course, as we come to Clinton's impeachment, which I covered in 1998 in the trial in 1999, is that we had gone up until uh, that point for 130 years without an impeachment. You know, we obviously had Nixon uh, who resigned in the face of an impeachment threat, but basically since the trial of Andrew Johnson, there had been no impeachment for the next 130 years. So it didn't leave enough of a bad taste in everybody's mouth that they didn't want to repeat it uh, at least quite so often. Now we seem to have had, now we've had four impeachment drives, three successful impeachments and three acquittals in the last 50 years. So I don't know what that means. Ken Starr told us on the Senate floor in 2019 that we have entered, or in 2020, that we've entered an age of impeachment. He had something to do with that, one might argue. But in any case, the Clinton impeachment was fascinating for a lot of reasons. First of all, during the trial, Clinton hired a former senator from his home state, Dale Bumpers, to represent him, among others, on the floor. And Dale Bumpers was a good old boy, Southern Democratic senator, former senator. And he said one thing that I think everybody remembered. He said, when they tell you it's not about sex, it's about sex. 
<laughs> and he got a laugh out of that because, in fact, of course, underlying this whole Clinton impeachment was sex. It was titillating. It was sensational. It was sleazy. It was icky. And as a reporter who had to write about a lot of stuff that I never, ever thought I'd ever put in the newspaper before, it was a whole different, uh, uh, you know, transformative event for journalism as it was for politics. Suddenly we were debating things that we never thought we would debate. I remember we had an argument in the newsroom as what constituted getting to second base uh, and whether or not we could call Clinton's relationship with Monica Lewinsky an affair or not. And basically the executive editor finally relented that we could call it an affair once he learned there were gifts involved and not just sex. Anyway, that's what we were debating in 1998. But it was important for a lot of reasons because while Dale Bumpers rightly said it was about sex, it was also about power. And I think that's what's often that was often missed about the Clinton impeachment because it was so titillating, because it was such a National Enquirer type scandal. Did, what did Monica think? Who did she talk to? All these kinds of things. But what we missed there is it's about, as, 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 as Brendan just talked about with Johnson, and I think Joshua will talk about with Trump, what Frank talked about in his history, it's about power. It's about accountability. It's about who, who holds power and how we divvy it up in our system. Right. We did create impeachment, as Frank said, as a check on an executive. So was this case, the case that they brought against Clinton, uh, an appropriate use of that power or not? Now, his uh, his allies would say no, because it's just criminalizing private behavior. He didn't use his office in order to you know, lie about his affair. He just simply uh, did it as a in a sense as a private individual. His critics would say, well, wait a second. The president of the United States has a unique off obligation to uphold the system of law. And he lied under oath in a court ordered by a judge, and he uh, obstructed justice by hiding evidence in a sexual harassment lawsuit in which he was obligated as a defendant to provide his evidence to uh, the system. And that while it may not have been a use of his office, how can a president who is supposed to oversee the democratic system and a rule of law system be allowed to get away with cheating in that system himself? So that was the big controversy in that time. You know, the, it did involve slavery and war. Nixon's corruption case seemed relatively straightforward. Once it was over, people sort of agreed, I think largely, that this is the kind of thing impeachment was about. But was Clinton's action, were Clinton's crimes, if you will, high crimes and misdemeanors? That was the essence of this debate. And of course, you had a, a partisan uh, debate, as Joshua alluded to a second ago, or a few minutes ago. You did have... Um, uh, a Republican majority that seemed bent on uh, impeaching him, not just because of the issues directly involved, because also they didn't like him, right? That they they disapproved of his policies, if you will. Policies weren't about reconstruction or something big like that, but they saw him as this as this libertine, uh, you know, leftover from the '60s who was bringing in, you know, uh, disrepute to the to the office. Never mind that a number of the Republicans who were prosecuting turns out to have been. Uh, not fully faithful to their own spouses as well. Um, and then you had the Democrats who stuck by Clinton and obviously were the bulwark that prevented him from being convicted. That was no accident, by the way. That was, in fact, a strategy by the president at that time. Partisanship was his shield. That was how he was going to stay in office, by making it not about himself, but about his opponents and how partisan they were. He made it partisan on his side. And as long as he could make it partisan on his side, he would lose in the Republican House where only a majority was required. But he knew that that meant he would not get a two-thirds conviction vote against him in the Senate, where the Democrats had more than a third of the seats. So partisanship was important to President Clinton in his defense. They had a strategy in the House Democratic Caucus. They called it win by losing. So they formulated all these votes in the committee, the Judiciary Committee, that they knew they would lose, intending to lose, so that there would be Republican versus Democrat, Republican versus Democrat votes the whole way. And the more it was about us versus them, the more it was, it was gonna it was gonna guarantee Clinton's survival. So that was a lesson of that impeachment, that partisanship, there's not gonna be such a thing as a, uh, a partisan impeachment that will succeed all the way because we're never gonna have, it seems like, uh, a Senate with two thirds dominated by one party. And so therefore partisanship becomes, is both a weapon, a uh, sword and a shield in effect. Uh, that was a lesson that you saw, and Joshua can talk about that later, I think, in some ways, uh, in the Trump uh, impeachment. Trump, in some ways, adopted some of what Clinton did. Um, Clinton, as as Trump would later uh, vilified Ken Starr, as Trump would Robert Mueller, he didn't do it himself. He was a little more 
judicious about how he handled it. He had people who did that for him. He didn't do the wet work himself. Trump did all the wet work himself. Uh, but he he made it out so that, again, that the t- target of, of anger and criticism was his opponent, Ken Starr. And there's as much debate about how Ken Starr handled the investigation as it was about how Clinton handled his own matters. The other difference, of course, but he, between him uh, the, the, him and Andrew Johnson and uh, Donald Trump is he apologized. He eventually it took six or seven months until he finally admitted that he was lying to the public. Uh, but once he did do that, he did apologize. He said he was wrong. He said he shouldn't have done it. And when he and he, when he uh, finally won the, the trial, he came out with and at least exhibited anyway a certain degree of humility and said, for my part in this, I, I you know, sorry for, for this and let's begin to heal. That, of course, also different than Johnson or Trump, who were virulent, uh, uh, you know, combative figures. The th- common area, though, between Clinton and Johnson, as Brenda just described, and I think this applies to Trump too, was a sense of victimhood, a sense of grievance, the sense that everybody was out to get him. He believed that firmly. He didn't express it as publicly as Trump did. Uh, but Clinton believed in the privacy of his, of his Oval Office, that this was a bum deal, that people were out to get him. His wife gave voice to it when she talked about the vast right-wing conspiracy, the sense of victimhood and grievance, the sense of paranoia, which is not necessarily unjustified, uh, was 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 a big factor in his White House as well. He was able to control it better in public. He compartmentalized better in public than, mm-hmm. than Trump did. He chose to anyway. Uh, but he felt it just as strongly, I think, as at these other two uh, impeached presidents. The difference, the other difference uh, between Clinton and these other two is Clinton was the first elected president ever to be impeached. Remember, of course, as, as Brendan r- r- told us, Johnson was not elected. He never had the, the support of the public. And for that matter, you could argue Donald Trump didn't either. He won the Electoral College, obviously, in 2016, but he didn't have a support of the popular vote in the election. And he never had the popular vote for a single day uh, uh, in the polls of his presidency. So when they impeached him twice, you could argue that's that's in keeping with a president who never actually had the kind of popular mandate that Clinton did have through two elections. Uh, and in fact, Clinton had arguably a, a ratification of his popular mandate during the impeachment with a midterm election that saw the Republicans not gain as they expected to 20 or 30 seats. They lost five seats. And the message that, that came that was perceived anyway from that vote was, we don't want to impeach Clinton. We don't like him for what he did, but we don't think it's worth impeaching him. Clinton's popularity numbers didn't go down during impeachment. They went up during impeachment. He was never so popular as president as when they impeached him. That made him popular, ironically. Now, that, again, you can see polls also say that they think, didn't think much of his morals, right? You wouldn't let your daughter go date him. But you did think that, you know, it didn't matter too much, the public said, to his conduct in office. The economy is good. We're at peace in the world, more or less. Let's go ahead and stick with what we know, and we don't have to make a, you know, a federal issue out of this. Last thing I'll say about this is because it was partisan, there was a, um, a missed opportunity to find a bipartisan resolution. Now, Democrats did not like Bill Clinton, and they didn't approve of this behavior. And quite, there was quite a few moments, if you go back and look at it, when the outcome was not necessarily foreordained. Um, there were moments when Democrats could have abandoned him. And, and, and the White House is very keenly worried about that, when Democrats could would get off the, sh- the boat and say, you got to get out of here, like, like Hugh Scott and Barry Goldwater and John Rhodes did with Nixon in 1974 and just say, that's it, you're done. We're not going to stand by anymore. Clinton prevented them from doing that for all the reasons we just talked about. One, popularity, the the approval rating certainly helped him. Two, making it partisan and and an us versus them kind of situation. And three, emphasizing the sex aspect of it and saying, well, that's really too cheap and tawdry to throw somebody out of office. But it very well could have been that he would have uh, lost the support of Democrats and and felt the pressure to resign. on the day of the impeachment, Bob Livingston, who was the incoming House Speaker, the Republican House Speaker, surprised everybody by uh, resigning himself because he had been caught having an extramarital affair. And there was this great panic in the White House on that day that that would open up the floodgates and there would be this movement among Democrats saying, yeah, yeah, let's just get this over with and have him leave too. And the pressure would build. And the, the way that Bill Clinton dealt with that was he had all the House Democrats come to the South Lawn and stand with him on the day he was impeached. And he would say, I'm not going to resign. I'm going to fill out the last day of the last uh, minute of my of, of my term. And that partisan uh, uh, defense of him, uh, you know, rebuilt, in effect, his his uh, his his lines of, 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 uh, of defense where they tried to find a bipartisan resolution, something they called a censure that could have passed in the sense that both sides agreed he did something wrong. 
uh, essentially wouldn't have added the effect of taking him out of office. It wouldn't have had any practical input, but it would have said that the Congress of the United States, both parties agree that what you've done is wrong, maybe illegal even. They might have said that in the century resolution had they you know, wordsmith it the right way. But the, the Republicans were adamant against that because they themselves, again, partisan, wanted to have an impeachment vote, even though they knew they were going to lose in trial. They would rather lose in trial than have a bipartisan condemnation of Clinton that would stand the test of time and, in their view, perhaps let Democrats off the hook by allowing them to say we're against this uh, without actually taking the hard vote of impeaching him. Now, last thing I'll say about this is that did not mean that Clinton didn't pay a price. Uh, and it didn't mean that he did do, didn't do anything wrong. The judge in the civil case, the Paula Jones sexual harassment case in which Clinton lied under oath about his relationship with Monica Lewinsky, found him in civil contempt for not telling the truth under oath and fined him uh, $25,000. He also ended up paying a settlement of uh, $800,000 or $850,000, I believe, to Paula Jones, who was the plaintiff in that lawsuit. $850,000 is a lot of money. And lastly, he had to strike a deal with Robert Ray who was Ken Starr's successor as independent counsel on the day before leaving office, in which the president admitted that he did not uh, tell the truth under oath and in, ex and in exchange agreed to give up his law license for five years and pay a $25,000 fine uh, to the, uh, the Bar Association of Arkansas. And in exchange for that, Robert Ray said he wouldn't prosecute him after leaving office. So there were penalties for Clinton that were, that were short of removal from office under the impeachment standard that we've just set. I'll, I'll leave it there. And I think that, again, that in some ways we could talk about when Josh gets through his part of it, how they compare, but there's there's an interesting some similarities between Clinton and, and Trump and obviously quite a lot of dif uh, uh, dis differences as well. Obviously the, ca the category of the crime is, is, is you know manifestly different and, 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 and something that uh, people will look at in a different way. Because I want uh, Joshua to have you know, ample time to chat, um, if, would either of the other two panelists like to make a short comment or question? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, Joshua, let, let, let you um, talk and hopefully there'll be uh, some time at the end of that for questions um, not only for other panelists, but I know that there are people watching who may have some things they want to ask. Sure. Well, uh, you know, Peter, thank you for that, that great explanation of the Clinton impeachment. Uh, that, that explanation is why his books are the best books that anyone could read on that subject. You know, and, and Brenda and Peter each opened by insisting that they're the odd duck out in this group. And so I feel, <laughs> I feel like I wasn't doing my part if I didn't do the same. <laughs> which is as the only person here who hasn't written a definitive book about one or another impeachment or the definitive book about the original meaning of impeachment, um, I feel lucky to be in your in your company. And, you know, rather than attempt, a, so my feeling about the Trump impeachment is everyone knows what happened or anyone likely to be at a, a symposium about impeachment does. So instead of giving a narrative about the impeachments, I just like to offer three points. Um, uh, one is a point about how to interpret the Constitution. The second is a point about the role that history plays in impeachment proceedings. And the third is a point about the historical significance of the Trump impeachments in loose comparison to the Johnson and the Nixon cases um, with a brief reference to the Clinton case. Uh, and these are more sort of big picture food for thought type, type points that I do think intersect with a lot of what Brenda and Peter have already put on the table. So I'd like to start, and, and, I, and I should say, I come at these points as a lawyer who, unlike, you know, I've, I've written about impeachment, but I've actually practiced impeachment law. So these questions to me are, have been a bit more immediate because I've been like sitting in the room with, with Jerry Nadler trying to answer them. So I come at this from a slightly different point of view. Um, so the first point I'd like to talk about is how to interpret the Constitution's impeachment clock provisions, um, you know, and, and, and frankly, the profound limits of the Constitution in trying to answer most questions that matter about impeachment, which, which I think Brenda and Peter's talks really prove up when you think about what they focused on. It was not the language of Article 2, Section 4, and for good reason, right? So the Constitution includes numerous provisions that together give rise to the impeachment power. And some of those provisions speak in definite terms. For instance, uh, for instance uh, you know, the, the, the Senate may not impose criminal penalties in a judgment of conviction. But many of the provisions speak in much broader terms, most famously Article 2, Section 4, uh, which authorizes impeachment in cases of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, uh, language that arguably raises more questions than it answers. Mm -hmm. you know, and frankly, it only gets worse from there. 
The Constitution says little or nothing about almost all of the significant decisions involved in any impeachment. It does not specify what process the House and its committees should follow. It doesn't define how the House may obtain evidence or what privileges or immunities may be raised against such an investigation. It doesn't define the standard of due process for the accused. Uh, it does not establish a standard of guilt or rules of evidence or rules of practice and procedure or rules for a trial or a timeline on which a trial must occur or guidance as to whether live witness testimony must be allowed uh, or even prohibitions on open public coordination between house prosecutors, uh, official defendants, and these senatorial judges. Um, and I have to tell you, when you're trying to do an impeachment, the, the lack of any rules on that is kind of a big deal. Most yes. fundamentally, the, the Constitution leaves up to the House and Senate the decision whether impeachment and conviction should occur at all. Now remember, impeachment is never mandatory, even in the face of clear, unmistakable high crimes and misdemeanors. The framers gave us impeachment as an emergency measure, but offered precious little guidance on when to use it and on when less extreme measures may actually be more efficacious. So in those respects, the Constitution sketches some important outlines, it makes some important decisions, like it gives this power to the House and the Senate, it sets supermajority voting requirement, it gives a rough standard, it limits the consequences of conviction. But the Constitution says very little or nothing about most of the questions that most of the people involved in this process have to answer in deciding whether and when and how to start an impeachment and then to do the whole impeachment. And history, I think, is crucial in helping to fill some of those interpretive gaps. So Professor Bowman and many others have written important work, um, some of which we saw at the beginning today, on, on lessons that we can draw from English, colonial, and early American practice. And as a matter of substantive constitutional law, of good faith adherence to the Constitution uh, as a written document, that history is crucial. It sheds light on why the impeachment power exists and what harms it seeks to avoid, principles that I thought were at the heart of both Trump impeachments Original understanding and our lived experience with the Constitution over time have also afforded precedents and principles and norms that offer a starting point, and sometimes more than that, in reaching concrete answers to the swarm of thorny legal questions that surround any impeachment. And those precedents, of course, come from all three branches of the federal government, but they also come from the popular understanding and reception of decisions reached in prior impeachments, which makes the work of folks like Brenda and Peter so incredibly important in defining what we all think impeachment really means. Moreover, history, if studied well and wisely, offers guidance on the prudent use of impeachment as a defense mechanism for democracy. It helps us grasp when and how to activate this grave constitutional power. That's history in the big, big eight sense of the term, right? But, and I'm afraid this is a very big but, the historical, the scope of historical experience has real limits in interpreting the Constitution's impeachment provisions and in giving them life. And so only a fool would barrel into an impeachment without a careful study of history and without reading all the books that, that we saw on the screen earlier. But it would be just as foolish to think that history offers the final word on nearly any of the questions most worth caring about here. The Constitution, like I said, entrusts the power to the House and Senate in an immediate sense to the American people themselves, um, but otherwise provides just a rough sketch and in the political blast furnace that accompanies any impeachment, historical norms and precedents, and frankly, sometimes constitutional text, have a way of going wobbly, especially since the rarity of impeachment and the fact of acquittal in every prior presidential impeachment trial means that there is almost nothing that ranks as concrete, settled precedent speaking to these core issues. Moreover, a key lesson of historical experience is that the events surrounding impeachment and Brenda and Peter both talked about this, are rife with contingency and are profoundly dependent on thousands of decisions, big and small, some of which superficially have nothing to do with impeachment itself, like the president's general state of uh, approval. Or in the Clinton case, you might all remember the wag the dog concern about President Clinton's adventures in, in foreign affairs and military affairs. You know, The outcome of an impeachment may also depend, as Peter explained, on the extent of partisan polarization and the degree to which the president and his opponents manage that dynamic. And so in those respects, a mastery of history is essential to grasping and practicing impeachment. So like this panel was ultimately all things considered a really good idea, but so is a recognition of history's limits and a forthright engagement with the profoundly difficult and deeply present day political and strategic judgments that the American people face in any impeachment, which calls for the kind of practical wisdom and historical perspective that I think Brenda and Peter so amply put on display in talking about the Johnson and the Clinton cases. 
Okay, so that's the first point. Let me turn to the second, which concerns the role of history in impeachment proceedings as evidenced by the Trump cases. So as I've just emphasized, while history has its limits, it is in fact essential to the practice of impeachment. That was certainly my experience. And there's many ways in which that happens. I'll highlight just a couple of them. And I say this not just by way of making historians feel good, but also by way of emphasizing that, that, that the, histor the history we're talking here is part and parcel of what impeachment is and of what it means and of any assessment of, of how it would operate. So in the, first, in the first and second Trump impeachments, I think we saw you know, the significance of history play out first and foremost in the political rhetoric that surrounded both impeachments. Rhetoric that was shot through with references to historical practice and precedent in a way that almost no other issues in American life are when you think about how they're talked about in mainstream media. We saw that in the nonstop news coverage and op-ed commentaries, much of which was written by historians. We also saw it in the forms of argument deployed in the reports and hearings and briefs and trial presentations in the parties, right? If you think back to the second Trump impeachment, jurisdiction day, that first day where we had to explain why there was jurisdiction to try the case, that was classic constitutional law in history mixed with a strong present day account of why the impeachment was justified. Um, and, and, you know, and I can say just in my work with the House Judiciary Committee and the House managers, I could not have been more impressed uh, at their commitment, their genuine commitment to studying and mastering the history and the historical issues as they sought to present these issues to the American people. Um, that went all the way down to Representative Jonah Goose and me on a call, figuring out where in the Senate chamber specific senators had been seated when they weighed the case of William Belknap back in the 19th century so that we could point to individual senators and be like, that guy sat in your chair and said the following. And so therefore you should also think the following, right? I mean, real use of history in a more, in that sort of more specific sense. Um, and so in those respects, the legal and political discourse and rhetoric of impeachment is shot through with deeply historical commitments and frames of reference. And frankly, when it comes to impeachment, like I've said, how people talk about it can't be separated from what it is and how it operates and whether it will succeed. But historical experience also cut more deeply into the Trump impeachments, including into some of the core judgments that the House and its attorneys made uh, in prosecuting and framing their case. And I'll, I'll give just a few examples here. In the first impeachment, one of the big decisions was to frame Trump's misconduct in the terms of abuse of power rather than bribery. Um, that decision resulted in substantial part from a deep study by the staff and members of both offenses and a considered view that I personally, along with others, discussed at a senior level with Chairman Schiff and Nadler, that bribery was not well suited as the charge based on the history and original understanding and prior practice as compared to abuse of power. And in the accompanying committee report, which I'm sure everyone here has on their bookshelves and has come to know and love, the committee took pains not only to give substance and specificity to its abuse of power charge, drawing heavily on Professor Bowman's scholarship, in fact, but it also took pains to refute the mistaken and dangerous belief that the Johnson impeachment, which was in many respects a core abuse of power impeachment, had been a political errand. And the committee took that step, not, you know, not just to correct the record for its own sake, but because it, get, it understood that the historical record shapes our understanding of impeachment in our own time. In that same impeachment, the, the obstruction of Congress charge, Article 2, which I alone was especially excited about, I think, uh, as, as the resident law geek, that was modeled in many respects on Article 3 of the House Judiciary Committee uh, charges against Richard Nixon. Uh, we read every report and every page of committee hearings on that article. We pulled from the archives every single internal, in, internal Judiciary Committee document that had been produced in relation to that and poured over them. And then we went deep into those sources. They were piled so high around my desk that for a period I couldn't get to my desk and like literally had to read my way through to get to, get to my computer. And we did that to ensure that if the charge was framed in historical terms, it was supported in every respect by the best available historical sources, which did affect the structure and, 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 and scope of the charge. Now, in contrast, the second impeachment turned less, I think, on historical study and a bit more on what I thought of as greater and more fundamental lessons of history, lessons about mobs and demagogues and the end of democracy, as Professor Bowman talked about at the beginning. And time and again, Representative Jamie Raskin, one of my personal heroes, pushed us to see that, the, see that broader fabric and to think about time, about our place in history, about the lessons that history imparted to us and about the dangers of the so-called January exception that Trump wanted to create in the constitution. But of course there was one wonky issue in that trial. And as it turns out, that issue was determinative or at least it provided the faintest fig leaf for senators who had misplaced their spines and wanted to acquit 
but couldn't bring themselves to address the sheer monstrosity of Trump's impeachable conduct. Of course, I'm referring to the jurisdictional issue. You may not believe me, but in our preparation, several managers and several of the staff formed a reading group and together consumed thousands of pages of law review articles and historical scholarship. Uh, that group believed to its core that text and history supported us. And while Trump was ultimately acquitted, a majority of the Senate agreed with us, again, reaffirming the precedent from the Belknap case. You know, we didn't do that just for giggles, right? That, that reflected a core belief about the right way to do this, which turned in significant part on understanding lessons of history and of prior practice. And so, uh, you know, when, when you talk about the Trump impeachments in historical perspective, right, historical perspective was essential to what the Trump impeachments were all about, to how the arguments and charges were framed, and to what the House and its staff and the managers un understood themselves to be doing. And in that respect, I do think the lessons of law and history do meaningfully guide and constrain important decisions made by members of the House and Senate, at least those acting in good faith in an attempt to really vindicate the Constitution. And so I'd like to conclude then with the third point, and I'll, I'll, I'll outline that only very roughly. And actually what Brenda said anticipated it almost to the T. And it's about the, the significance and nature of the Trump impeachments as understood in what I'll describe as loose historical perspective. Um, and I say loose because I'm sure the analogy will break down if you stare at it too hard, but it might do a little bit of work here. Um, uh, you know, and, and here's the here's the thought that I had, which is in some ways, the first Trump impeachment is most of a piece with the Nixon impeachment and maybe to a lesser extent, the Clinton impeachment. They involve significant concerns about executive misconduct that in the first Trump case and the, and the Nixon case really went to the core of how democratic politics are practiced in our country and how we think about self-government and presidential, presidential interference with elections in particular. Um, uh, and in that respect, you know, the damage that the presidents there had done was extraordinary and the stakes were high. Um, but, but I don't think in either case it would be fair to describe the issues as in some respects existential. I think they went to very deep questions about who we are as a country and what it means to live in a democracy. But in those cases, and, and certainly in the Clinton case, it was much more about drawing a clear line about what is in bounds and what is out of bounds for the sake of ensuring that going forward, those lines don't get muddled again and recognizing the damage that gets crossed when they do. It was in, in some respects, all three impeachments were about vindicating and restoring a certain substantive conception of appropriate democratic politics and presidential behavior. Um, and they were, you know, although they implicated very deep questions, the country itself was not literally on the line. Um, the, uh, the Johnson impeachment, I think, is really in some respects the, the historical analogy for the second Trump impeachment. Because I think in both cases, there's a sense that the question at stake in the impeachment is, are we going to continue as a union? And what does that mean to be a union? Right. This was about presidential conduct that threatened the fabric that makes us a country. Uh, Brenda's scholarship and that of others, I think, has really brought back that narrative and that understanding of the Johnson impeachment, which was written out of a lot of history books in the late 19th century as part of a very sort of like early Jim Crow white supremacist conception of what was at stake there. And we now have an understanding that really the question of the Johnson impeachment was you know, what does it mean to be a union on the other side of civil war and one that actually rebuilds and reintegrates the South and reintegrates, you know, the formerly freed slaves, not only, you know, as, as citizens and makes them whole and part of this country. You know, and in some ways, the second Trump impeachment goes to equally fundamental qu questions. In this age of intense partisan polarization, what does it mean to live together amid conflict over the ground rules that shape and structure our democracy? Can we find ways to preserve order and the peaceful transfer of power? And can the country come together to reject a demagogue who seems to put his own power and advancement above any other principle we may hold? You know, and, and much like the significance of the Johnson impeachment cannot be understood a few months after it ended, but really took shape in the chastisement of Johnson that limited his power for the next several years and that ultimately paved the way through reconstruction up until maybe the, the mid-1870s. I don't think we can really understand at this point the significance of the second Trump impeachment. You know, from a certain point of view, that impeachment is still underway. The battle that it was a part of is with us. Those battles are still being fought and defined. The outcome of the next election and the next one after that will have a whole lot to do with how it's understood. And so when you have these big existential impeachments like Johnson and like Trump too, it's not the story of a trial and then it's over. It's the story of a moment in American history and, and the fate of the American experiment. So I say that that's a very grand claim. I'm sure you could poke a bunch of holes in it. Um, 
you know, and obviously it's still too soon to know how all of these will be seen. If the situation in Ukraine blows up, the first Trump impeachment is going to look very different in the court of history than if it doesn't. Uh, and, you know, if Trump is elected again in, the, you know, in 2024 or he isn't, that second impeachment is going to look very different. And so we're still very much writing that story. But in terms of rough analogies that give us a sense of their significance, that's at least a stab at it. Um, and so with that, I'd just like to, to thank, thank everyone here for, for their wonderful contributions. Because I think these, these three presentations, the four presentations, are really all of a piece. Joshua, thank you so much. I mean, that was absolutely stunning. As, as uh, I've had the pleasure of being on two panels with you now, and uh, it's, it's always it's always a pleasure uh, and, and, and a sort of an intellectual feast. Um, let me respond to your last point with what may be a mild disagreement um, or different disagreement of category. I wouldn't disagree with you for one second about the consequential character of the Johnson impeachment and the second Trump one. I think they're very much of a piece in that respect. I see them a little differently though in this way. And maybe Brenda will get in and, and disagree entirely with me, but in one sense, the Johnson impeachment was, it was about two computers competing views of what the country would become, two competing views of the constitutional order. And although because uh, particularly of, of the racial component of Johnson's views and, uh, and his determination to keep it a white man's country and the like, um, his position is easy to disparage, I think. But from a constitutional point of view, it, it, could, it could be defended. He basically viewed um, the Constitution in a particular way. He wanted the Union as it was. Um, changed very little by the, the fact of civil war, with the exception, of course, of the elimination, of the technical elimination of legal slavery. But he wanted a, the, the resumption of a relationship between the national government and the states, as it had essentially been before the war. Um, where the states remained essentially quasi-sovereign and the national government remained um, it was very difficult for the national government to impose its views on the states or indeed to protect the rights of individual citizens within those states by sort of going through the, the state sovereignty. Now, I, of course, disagree entirely with that view, but it seems to me not in the, in the, in the understanding of the time, it was not an indefensible one. And I think Johnson... Uh, believed it, believed it to the core of his being. He was a racist, yes, but he also had certain very strongly held constitutional views, which I, I now disagree with. But I think, you know, you could defend that from from the, the from the constitutional perspective of the time. Nonetheless, I think the impeachment of Johnson was the right thing to do, and I think he should have been con convicted because I think that on rare occasions when there are irreconcilable differences between Congress and the president on the essential nature of the, of the constitutional compact. And those, di those differences are of sufficient severity and the, the, the disagreement are absolutely irreconcilable. I think Congress gets to choose. And I think the mo one of the ways by which Congress gets to choose if necessary is impeachment. Um, the distinction I think between the Johnson situation and the Trump one is that there, there is no defense of Trump's constitutional view. He wasn't expressing a constitutional view. He was trying to tear down the Constitution and destroy the, you know, the, the peaceful transfer of power and, and the mode by which the Constitution affects that. Um, so while I think it's equally consequential, I think it's consequential in a different kind of way. Um, not a choice between at least plausible constitutional visions of the future, but the choice between either we continue as a constitutional democracy or we don't. And uh, I have, can I say something? I, I can't resist. Um, but of course, Joshua and Frank, um, correct me because again, I'm not a legal scholar, but where I would take issue, Frank, from my benighted point of view, is about the constitutional, the, the two views as we presented them, the, the Constitution 
where Johnson wants to turn back the clock, but he wants you know, state sovereignty in this kind of federal fabric. The problem with that view, and that would be okay if there hadn't been a civil war. I don't think you can forget that 11 states seceded from the government, from, from the union. So it's a really interesting constitutional question with what you do with them. Now, Johnson said, secession is against the law. So they never seceded. I mean, I don't even know how to respond to that kind of maneuvering um, of semantics. Of course, and yeah, Lincoln didn't want to say they had seceded but they formed what they thought was a government and they had a government with its own constitution. They lost the war. So the question then is, how do you now read the constitution? You can't, you can't just ignore what happened and say, everything's fine. We're going to go back and just have two different views of the constitution from my point of view. Suddenly everything is on the table because you have to, at the very basis, forgetting the racism, forgetting everything else, you have to say, how are you going to admit or readmit these states? What do they have to do in order to get back into the union? Whose prerogative is that? Constitutionally, as I understand it, it's the prerogative of Congress. Johnson. Yeah, the, only, the only thing I would say, just to, just to break in, so that we can okay, move no, on, is no, just no. is simply to say, remember, if I'd have been living at the time, I'd have been a radical Republican. At least I think we always flatter ourselves that we were the good, we would have been the good guys when we lived at the time. But I, I think I would have been a radical Republican. I agree with you. Yeah, I think the fact that there was a war changes the the the, the, the basic character, and I think that Congress had the right to do it. But I'm just saying that that we're un, unlike Trump, um, I think Johnson had a genuinely deeply held notion about how the constitutional order should be, uh, and he was willing to go to the mat for it. I think he was a, I think he was dead wrong for lots of reasons which you detailed in your wonderful book. Okay, yeah. well, I don't get too much, but one one of, I mean, he basically said the Constitution protects slavery. So, I mean, of course, these are different views of the Constitution, but it, it just seems so hard to then pretend something that happened didn't happen and changes that view of the Constitution forevermore going forward. Then it becomes an interesting question of how do you read it now? That's OK, I'm done. I'm yeah, no, I'll just say I agree with Brenda on that point. I mean, the, I don't actually I don't think the question is whether the president's views that purport to justify his conduct are genuinely held or held on it sincerely, which are words that you used, Frank. You know, the, the president can subjectively and, 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 you know, honestly believe all sorts of things. You know, and the fact that the president or his lawyers or apologists can dress up those ideas, you know, in legalistic or political language that that sort of vaguely resembles a constitutional theory isn't isn't enough in my mind to isn't enough in my mind, I guess, to say, you know, you know, well, Trump Johnson had a constitutional theory and Trump didn't. Johnson's constitutional theory had just killed 750,000 people and nearly wrecked the union. And trying to reoperationalize that was an invitation to the destruction of the constitutional project. And it was not a constitutional vision that was legitimate or that anyone, like the fact that he subjectively believed it is of no moment to me. And Trump has a constitutional vision too. If you asked him, I don't know whether he could articulate, but I'm sure there's some clever lawyers at the National Review or somewhere who could and who have tried to in journals like American Greatness and whatever. And you know, the fact that some group of second rate intellectuals comes around to apologize for someone's pretensions to power doesn't mean that their substantive commitments are fundamentally anti-constitutional in a way that justifies impeachment. And I think that's very true of both Johnson and Trump. Sorry, Brent, I hope you don't mind. I'm expressing your view maybe even a bit more heatedly. Peter, I want to get, I want to get Peter in this. <laughs> Peter, well, I, I, you don't. You don't need me on Johnson. I, I I defer to the experts on this. I think yeah. it's fascinating. I, I think the I think the trouble for for looking at it in terms of precedence is that the is that the, the nub of the issue, as Brenda rightly uh, and Joshua focus on, is not what was actually charged. Right, the actual articles which were drawn up only after the first vote 
if I remember correctly, were, you know, they violated a, a law that was later found to be unconstitutional, seen con unconstitutional on space, and that he was charged with insulting Congress. If insulting Congress is, a, is an impeachable <laughs> offense, we'd have a lot more impeachments. So the interesting thing is that the, the Republicans, radical Republicans at the time, didn't choose to frame their argument in a way that would have been more interesting, right? Johnson subverted, you know, we hereby charge Johnson with subverting the democracy that we've just gone to war to preserve in this way and that way. And that would have been that would have been um, easier for subsequent impeach impeachment scholars like Joshua, who have to then come and make sense of it to say, aha, we see how that, you know, fits into our our um, uh, our pattern today or our situation today. But the point of, of course, the reason they didn't, of course, there there is a general there's a there's a, a catch all provision at the end of those articles that Brenda talks about. But I would submit that the reason that they didn't rely on the basic theory that that Johnson was behave, behaving unconstitutionally, da 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 da, which is which they lay out an argument. Ben Butler and Thaddeus Stevens actually make precisely those arguments. And John Bigham, wonderful. Yeah, they they make those arguments, but. I think the reason that they don't make them the basis of the articles of impeachment is as obvious as that seems to us right now, they didn't think that the, that, that approach would appeal to the public, I believe. Mm -hmm. They didn't think they could sell um, a somewhat more modern view of what that conflict was about and how the country ought to uh, ought to transform itself. Uh, and and they, they didn't want to go that way because it was too, I think it was because it was too politically dangerous. And it was much simpler to frame the thing in terms of violation of the, 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 the Tenure of Office Act, which could then be talked about in terms of simple crime. If only they had polling. <laughs> and in some ways, that's I think that that gets to a very deep point, which is, you know, in, in, in some ways, impeachment is this very technical and legalistic process. Yeah. You know, you know, I mean, when we were drafting those articles, you can rest assured we labored over every molecule <laughs> that appeared in that text. Right. Mm -hmm. Are these charging documents well, well structured? Are they capturing the right thing? And there's all these questions of form that come with the impeachment. And they matter a lot when yeah. people say impeachment is just politics like you try lawyering and impeachment and then tell me that an impeachment is just politics. You know, on the other hand, they're also deeply political in, in ways that Peter and Brenda, I thought, highlighted so beautifully. And, you know, and, and I think, you know, and, and, and those in, the way those two things interact is always a little combustible, especially, you know, and I think that was maybe especially the case in the Johnson period, where there wasn't really as well formed an understanding and as well developed an understanding as there is in some respects now of the impeachment power. And where I do think you're right, Frank, that the contemporaneous understanding of it was a bit more legalistic and technical and would have been less amenable politically and otherwise to this broader conception of what Johnson did that justified his removal. At the same time, at the same time, right, you can say like everyone in the Senate understood yeah. that, the, that the ultimate question was not the, the constitutionality of the Tenure of Office Act. Right. And so... Even though you are right, Frank, that that's not what they charged, and Peter makes a good point that they maybe they could have charged it differently, and they didn't charge it, and they presumably didn't charge it that way for political and other reasons. You know, there was a mismatch there between the charge and the substance of what he was really on trial for, and and it, you know, I think when Brenda and I talk about the correctness of the Johnson impeachment, we're referring to what the trial was actually for, right. and more importantly, what it was contemporaneously, subjectively understood to be for. Yeah. Um, Whereas I think, you know, there's an instinct to be like, oh, well, the House charged the wrong thing, so that's on them. <laughs> Oops. You know, and, and I just don't think that's really satisfying as an account of, of what happened there. I also don't think that they 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 decided to go for the legalistic um, because for political reasons only, because they were pretty um, they were pretty irate by this time. I think that they really believe, my sense is that they really believe that that's how you prosecute an impeachment successfully because there hadn't been no precedence for presidential impeachment. And so they were really improvising and in a sense taking cover on, with the law. And it was the breaking, it was the violation of the law that finally got Johnson impeached. There had been several t attempts before to impeach him that had failed. So they, in some sense, 
had to use the legalistic arguments. But as Frank, you said, in the arguments that they made in the Senate, they were not legalistic at all. They were actually larger and constitutional and really did have to do with abuse of power. Anyway, it, it's, hmm. we shouldn't go on about it like this. There are other questions, but. Well, we are, we are teetering on the, within the last minute of our allotted time. Oh, um, is there, I, I haven't actually gotten any questions from folks outside or maybe uh, trying to look here. Nope, not. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, sure there are some. I'm not sure what's left to ask. I think we've about covered it. <laughs> yeah, I've covered it all. All right, we're done. One, one um, thing I would add, and it's kind of a downer, but, um, but, but it's a warning. And that is Andrew Johnson, after he was impeached but acquitted, he went back into the Senate. He did take his seat as a senator from Tennessee in 1875. He didn't fill the term because he died, but I consider that something to think about as a kind of warning um, when we think of going forward uh, and not indicting people or keeping them out of office. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um <laughs> okay, I've actually uh, Gunner is is texting me a couple of questions. Have you guys got a couple of minutes to answer questions, or do you need to go? I, I got a few minutes. Can I just very quickly? I can't help myself. Add that what Brenda's point really ties with what Peter said, right? Peter emphasized that there were consequences for Clinton. There wasn't this sense that he walked away wholly unscathed. You know, when a president commits certain offenses and walks away wholly unscathed, I think that's when you invite great mischief. Mm. And I don't only say that because I am currently suing President, former President Trump in multiple cases for his misconduct. <laughs> sure, no bias there at all. No bias. Um, I, I, I think there may be some other coming, but here's one um, that is directed um, to Professor Wineapple. Um, so I'll read it. It's, it's, it's way down into the weeds. So here we go. Um, I'd be interested to hear what evidence you've marshaled to show that Edmund Ross was bribed to vote in favor of acquitting President Johnson. Uh, the, the commenter says, it goes on and says, I think there's ample support in Profiles in Courage and other contemporary works that Ross believed that Johnson did have the right to remove Secretary of War Stanton because the Tenure Act was unconstitutional. Um, as the Supreme Court suggested in Dicta and Meyer versus, versus the United States. Therefore, these actions didn't merit impeachment. Is there significant evidence to rebut then Senator Kennedy's suggestion that Ross, a former major in the Union Army and opponent of slavery, voted for acquittal based on the belief, quote, that Ross had taken an oath to do impartial justice according to the Constitution and laws and trusted that he would have the courage to vote according to the dictates of his judgment for the highest good of the country? Thank you very much. So what's your evidence that Ross was bribed? <laughs> well, I didn't bring it with me. And it one of the things I would have loved to have found the smoking gun, you know, with the smoke still in it. But at a distance of 150 or so years, it was very, very difficult to to track everything down. Although after the impeachment, there were hearings about the bribery, the various briberies, and a lot of those hearings are missing. What I will say is that, and that's why I said, if not bribery, certainly quid pro quo, there is a paper trail of Ross to Johnson asking him for favors and receiving them in, um, in payment. He doesn't use that word. It's another word I can't remember right now in payment for the vote that he took. So there's a, a there's that actual paper trail and there's a great deal of circumstantial evidence. My sense that Profiles and Courage was based on largely the books that were two things, partly on the books that were written in the twenties, um, things called books called The Age of Hate. Um, and uh, were written trying to exonerate Andrew Johnson and certainly Ross. And also, as Peter mentioned, Ross's own self-justifying memoir of what he did and why he did it. 
He did need money. He was in a boarding house with people who were known Confederate sympathizers. He did get jobs for other people. So as I say, that there's a whole web around Ross, particularly because he was going to vote until the last minute to convict, um, to convict, I was going to say Trump, Johnson. So again, I cannot give you the actual signed checks, um, alas, but the circumstantial evidence and also the primary evidence seems, seems very persuasive. Well, thank you all so much. This is a great start for what is going to continue to be some great conversations tomorrow. For those who are watching, please remember that uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin, um, of whom we've already heard uh, so much, is going to be talking uh, tonight at uh, 6 p.m. Central Time, 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, and we hope that you will tune back in to hear his, uh, his remarks about his personal experience as uh, the lead manager for the second impeachment and his reflections on what that means and what it, uh, what it may hold for the future. Thanks again to all three of you. You were wonderful. I learned so much. Um, Thank you. Incredibly grateful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Frank. Thank you.
There I am, just waiting for Congressman Raskin. Yeah. There he is. Okay. Um, well, uh, folks, welcome back uh, to the, the second session of today's uh, first day of our impeachment of our symposium on the two impeachments of Donald J. Trump. Uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome as our keynote speaker tonight, Congressman Jamie Raskin. Um, I can say that I had the, the honor and the pleasure to a very small degree to consult occasionally with members of his staff during the, the impeachment processes and on a couple of occasions to speak directly with him. Um, and I can attest that he's a wonderful human being as well as being um, uh, an astounding uh, public servant. A few words about uh, Congressman Raskin's career before we uh, let him inform us. Uh, he is a Democratic congressman from Maryland's 8th District. Um, he is an honors graduate of both Harvard College and the Harvard Law School. For more than 25 years, uh, he taught uh, constitutional law and other things at American University's Law School. In 2006, he was elected to the Mar Maryland legislature as a state senator, where in 2012 he became uh, the majority whip of the Maryland Senate. He was first elected to Congress in 2016, assuming office in January of 2017. And since then, uh, he has assumed a prominent role in the House of Representatives uh, with, I may say, remarkable speed, given the shortness of, of his tenure. Um, he has served on the Judiciary Committee, uh, most particularly for our subject um, during both the Trump impeachments, winning, I think, general acclaim for his cogent articulation of difficult constitutional questions. Um, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi named him uh, lead manager for the second Trump impeachment. Um, and most of those viewing this symposium, I suspect, will have watched his truly outstanding performance in that role, a performance um, made uh, more impressive and I think deeply poignant by the fact that he'd lost his son, Tommy, tragically only weeks before the impeachment trial began. Congressman Raskin is now one of nine members of the House Select Committee investigating 
uh, the January 6th uh, attack on the Capitol. Um, and I could sing his praises for a long time, but you don't want to hear me do that. You want Congressman Raskin uh, to inform and enlighten us. And so with no further ado, uh, Congressman Raskin. Professor Bowman, uh, what a pleasure, what an honor it is to be with you and with uh, the Missouri Law Review and to be part of your symposium. Uh, thank you for all of your remarkable contributions to our public life, to our constitutional discourse, and specifically to our understanding and knowledge of the impeachment process historically and, uh, and today. So um, I have uh, not yet written systematically about the impeachment trial uh, in a law review context, although in, in my book, um, Unthinkable, which is out now, I do spend uh, several chapters talking about some of the critical decisions um, that we made. And um, so I'm going to venture some uh, thoughts here, some of which appear in Unthinkable, some of which are not part of it, but some of which uh, I'm hoping to be able to whip into shape as part of your symposium. So I, I thank you for the opportunity to think through, uh, you know, some of the reflections I'm going to offer here. So one thing is actually about the, uh, the first impeachment, because I have a profound critique uh, not of uh, not of the Republicans, but of the Democrats here, because I think that the majority failed. And here I'm not referring to um, to the, um, to Jerry Nadler, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, or Adam Schiff, who ended up being the lead impeachment manager, or anyone involved with the impeachment team. But I say collectively we failed, and I would probably blame myself the most because I was in the the best position to counter this. But we really fell down on the job in not placing the, the then president's um, profound and continuing violations of the foreign and the domestic emoluments clauses at the very center of that impeachment. I believe that violation of the emoluments clauses was um, the original sin of the Trump administration. It began essentially on the first day of Trump in office when he said he was not going to give up his more than 150 businesses. Uh, he was uh, not going to stop doing business with foreign governments. Um, and um, he was not taking any pledge about refusing to take money from the federal government. The, uh, the Foreign Emoluments Clause states that, uh, that no uh, president, no federal official may accept presents, emoluments, which are payments, offices or titles of any kind, whatever, from a foreign government uh, without the consent of the Congress. Um, and yet uh, Donald Trump immediately began taking at uh, the Trump uh, Hotel in Washington, which I call the Washington Emolument, um, and at other hotels um, and at the golf courses and in other business ventures around the world, all kinds of money from foreign governments. Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars began to pour in from uh, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab uh, Emirates, from China, from a whole bunch of governments around the world. And because this was uh, such a flagrant departure from U.S. history, we were unprepared to deal with it. We didn't have a process for dealing with it. Um, and I'm afraid that a lot of the Democrats felt it was too complicated for people to understand. Some of it was just the word emoluments, which is multisyllabic. And I think we foolishly succumbed to the idea that it was too complicated for people to understand when most Americans can understand a good scam and a good grift when they see it. The domestic emoluments clause limits the president to his salary while in office um, and um, says that the president may accept no other money from the federal government or from the states. And yet again, immediately, um, the Trump hotels and other business ventures owned by Donald Trump and his family were collecting all kinds of money from government agencies, from the FBI, from the Secret Service, from the Department of Defense, on and on and on, which were uh, either voluntarily signing up or being told by the president to sign up to do various events at various Trump properties and so on. So Donald Trump 
uh, went around saying, I don't even accept my salary. I'm not going to accept my $400,000 salary. So presumably, hey, it's okay to take millions of dollars from the federal government. Your salary is the only thing you're allowed to take as the president of the United States. You're not allowed to take the other stuff. None of that money was allowable. In fact, it's categorically forbidden and proscribed. You can't do it. At least with the foreign emoluments, um, there is the out that you can accept it if the Congress consents. And there's a long history of presidents uh, going to Congress to ask for consent to keep this or that trinket or item that they got from a foreign government. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was given an elephant tusk by the King of Siam and wanted to keep it. And in the middle of the Civil War, went to the pains of writing to the Congress to ask if it was okay. Um, and it, the answer comes back from Congress, no, you may not keep that. Um, compare that to Donald Trump, who's simply pocketing millions of dollars from foreign governments. Now, it is true that when public objections were raised, Trump decided that he was going to make voluntary payments for what he described as the profits he was making from foreign governments. And then he paid several hundred thousand here, several hundred thousand there. There was no accounting of it. Um, there was no definition of where it was coming from. It wasn't uh, ascribed to particular foreign governments. And so there was no clarity around it at all. In any event, the whole thing was an absolute uh, departure from constitutional norms because uh, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 8 doesn't say that the president can't accept profits from foreign governments. It says it can't, that he can't accept any emoluments of any kind at all, any payments, any emoluments, offices or titles from kings, princes and foreign governments. Uh, so uh, he, of course, didn't give us the accounting paperwork to see what he was describing as profits or whatnot. You can only imagine what Donald Trump's accounting was like. I think the, the, the New York Attorney General is uh, uh, investigating that right now in terms of, uh, the, you know, purported bank fraud and uh, uh, tax fraud and accounting fraud and so on. But in any event, um, none of that uh, was consistent with constitutional norms. The whole point of the emoluments clauses is the president of the United States and other federal officials have to have complete undivided fiduciary duty and responsibility and loyalty to the American people and not to foreign governments and not to their own money-making uh, enterprises. And yet here was a president who overthrew all of that and essentially transformed the presidency into a money-making operation, which explains his determination at all costs to stay in office. So the Ukraine venture, the Ukraine shakedown, was of course uh, an appalling violation um, of the president's responsibilities. But I think that it was basically incomprehensible to people because they didn't understand why he wanted so badly to stay in power that he would shake down a foreign government, withhold foreign aid until the president of a foreign nation, President Zelensky, agreed to smear his likely opponent, Joe Biden, in the next election. And I think that if we had told the story properly, we would have put the emoluments clause front and center. Okay, so all of that is a, a little prefatory digression, Frank, so forgive me. Um, let me talk about the, the second um, impeachment. Um, and the, I just wanna raise um, several different points. I'm gonna begin with some things that I fault myself for, um, things that I wanted to do that I failed to do that I wish I had done and, you know, um, the reason I'm not a litigator is because I stay up all night thinking about the things I should have said and the things I ought to have done. The, the real litigators tell me that that is not an uncommon syndrome. Um, but, uh, you know, I was up for weeks thinking about particular things I thought about doing, but I decided not to do and so on. But let me just start with a couple of procedural motions that were in my mind that I was warned away from basically by people in the Senate uh, who said, you know, this would not be a good way to introduce Professor Raskin uh, to the U.S. Senate. But one of them, and this bugged me from the beginning, was to, um, to move that the Senate change its seating arrangements. When you 
go over there. It's like the House of Representatives in that uh, if you're looking if you're looking from the podium, if you're looking from the dais out there, you've got all of the Republicans to the left and you've got all of the Democrats uh, to the right and the independents who are caucusing uh, with the Democrats. OK, that's fine, I suppose, for a legislative assembly. One of the first things I learned in uh, uh, introduction to American government is where you sit is where you stand. Legislative leaders love to have all of their people together so they can communicate to them. But also we know from the social psychologists that it promotes kind of collective thinking, shall we say. Um, but that's not what a trial is. Imagine becoming a juror in a criminal trial and being seated according to your political party registration. That just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and so in order to try to get them to start thinking like jurors, people who had signed an independent oath beyond their original oath of office to uphold and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, but then to subscribe to another oath saying that they would render impartial justice. Um, in order to get them thinking along those lines to break up that, uh, that partisan assignment of seats and have people just sit alphabetically. Um, and I was told that this would be uh, something that would be upsetting to the senators on both sides. A lot of the senators are older. They are creatures of habit. They've got their stuff in their desks. Uh, they don't want to be moved. Uh, their possessions had just been rifled by the QAnon shaman and the insurrectionists who had broken in to the chamber, and they really didn't want to be moved like that. And um, essentially, it was it would be it would have been taken as an insult and indignity by them. So I withdrew on that. Similarly, I withdrew uh, on a proposal that I wanted to advance for a secret ballot. I mean, there's nothing saying that they've got to vote um, uh, in public on it. That, of course, is the standard norm of Senate procedure generally, but we were being told by a lot of senators that there were two kinds of fears that made uh, open voting a problem. One was the security fears. I mean, we had just you know, suffered uh, this terrible violence that had uh, overcome the Capitol. They had laid siege to the Capitol. They'd invaded uh, the Senate sanctum. The only thing that kept them from getting into the House was uh, the police officer who fired the shot at Ashley Babbitt, uh, which killed her. Um, but that was when the mob turned around from storming the House chamber. Um, but uh, multiple people died that day. Several officers took their lives afterwards. There were 150 injured officers, broken jaws, noses, necks, uh, shoulders, arms, legs, missing fingers, traumatic brain uh, injuries, post-traumatic stress syndrome, you name it. I still have constituents who are officers on the Capitol Force or the Metropolitan Police Department Force who are in physical or mental therapy because of um, the physical and psychological wounds inflicted on that day. Um, so, um, yeah, so there was a lot of violence in the air. There were continuing threats. There were ex domestic violent extremist groups that were calling for uh, a rerun of the insurrection on Inauguration Day. We had National Guardsmen and women camped out all over the place to protect the Capitol. So there were a lot of threats going on. And there was the suggestion made by several uh, senators and members of Congress that there needed to be a secret ballot um, so that that people at least could theoretically vote in such a way not to subject themselves to potential violence and death threats and so on. But perhaps more importantly, there was the threat of political retaliation because Donald Trump had made it clear that he wanted to exact retribution against anyone who maintained their oath to the Constitution and acted loyally as an independent, dispassionate juror, rendering impartial justice, as opposed to simply declaring publicly in advance, I'm going to be voting for Donald Trump as if it were an election instead of a trial. So the, that was the, the genesis of the idea of, of asking for a secret ballot. But um, again, in practical terms, uh, the, the you know various people we spoke to um, in the Senate on both sides of the aisle said it wouldn't work. Everybody understood that uh, 50 Democratic senators were going to be voting to convict. 
Um, and I think that was a fair supposition. So uh, it would not be too difficult to determine um, which Republican senators voted uh, to convict um, because people would come out and say how they had voted. Of course, they could have lied. But again, they saw this as an essential insult to their dignity um, and the, the dignity of their chamber. Um, I have maybe somewhat fewer regrets about letting go on that one uh, as opposed to the seating arrangements. But again, on that, I still feel that I that it was the wrong thing not to have opened up a conversation about it. But you got to understand when we started that trial, there was a lot of skepticism about us. The, the last trial had not left a good, uh, good taste in their mouth. Um, and we were being lectured before we had done anything um, about what they didn't want us to do. Uh, they did not want sermonizing. They did not want long speeches. They did not want uh, long political science lectures. They did not want long quoting uh, from the Federalist Papers. Uh, they felt as if all of that um, was condescending and patronizing to them. And that was why, uh, one reason why, um, you know, I decided, I resolved very early on that we were going to place overwhelming emphasis on the facts of what had happened. Um, we were going to tell one story, and this was the very first speech that I gave to uh, the remarkable impeachment managers who were part of my team, that we were not going to have a collection of speeches. It was not going to be one person makes a speech, another person makes a speech. We were going to have one complete story that theoretically could be told by one person, but it would be much more effectively told by many people as long as we were working together to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then we would address the legal dimensions and ramifications of it through the telling of the story rather than saying, okay, and now we're going to have 45 minutes or an hour and a half where we're going to talk about the First Amendment or we're going to talk about due process. We would integrate the constitutional and legal arguments into the elucidation of the facts, or, or we would deal with them in the question and answer period that came after the openings um, of our arguments. So, um, but I think that we succeeded in having a very dramatic and vivid telling of the facts as we understood them. There was a remarkable job done by our staff and by the members and the lawyers, Barry Burke, who was our chief counsel um, in collecting, you know, pouring over literally tens of thousands of images, photographs, video to try to put the story together as quickly uh, as possible. And then we arranged it into an overall narrative, again, incorporating, you know, the legal components um, along the way. Um, and that was what we did uh, to try to win over a Senate that was very skeptical. They were still they felt exhausted from the last one, which had deepened uh, partisan animosity. Um, and people were saying, when we started, there's no way you're going to get any Republican votes or any more than possibly Mitt Romney, who had voted with us the last time, because the few, there was such a sense of embitterment left over from the, the prior trial. Um, and exhaustion. So we resolved there was going to be nothing boring about what we did. We were not going to be condescending or patronizing to them anyway. And I know our colleagues were not acting uh, that way uh, to them, and yet they interpreted the whole thing like that. So we resolved to have a much shorter, much more compact and dense, factually dense uh, presentation to them. Um, People ask me the question, well, did I really think that we could win? Did I think that we could get 67 votes? And actually, I thought right up until um, the votes were taken that we had a chance of getting 100 votes. I thought that the presentation of the facts was so overwhelming and so irrefutable and certainly so unrefuted that there was really nothing to be said on the other side. And clearly, the lawyers for Trump had very little to say on the other side. Uh, and their presentation, of course, inspired um, a lot of humor, a lot of levity, a lot of comedy, a lot of ridicule. Um, and you know, even 
the Trump's strongest supporters basically abandoned his legal team and said that they were just doing a terrible job. I think in the end, it kind of helped Trump because they became a magnet for so much hostility and ridicule that it took people's eyes off of Trump's own conduct and his own actions. And of course, I felt bad for them because they didn't have really anything to go on because uh, Trump's conduct was so overwhelmingly culpable. Um, he so clearly had incited a violent insurrection um, and so clearly had been uh, running an inside political coup against the 2020 uh, election in order to overthrow Biden's electoral college majority. Um, so the, it, you know, in the final analysis, um, there were some habits of partisanship and habits of obedience to Donald Trump that prevented us from getting to 100 or prevented us from getting to 67. Um, I actually thought that 76 was a far more likely number than 67. And I'll tell you why. I felt like we could not get, um, we couldn't win unless McConnell was on our side and McConnell would not vote to convict unless there was a majority of the Republican caucus with him. There was no way he was going to be voting with a minority of the GOP caucus because that, of course, is his future. He wanted to make sure that a majority was going to be with him. So I always felt that 67 was an unlikely number, that is 50 Democrats and 17 Republicans, um, certainly less likely than 76, which would have been 50 uh, plus 26, an exact 50 plus 1 percent uh, majority of the Republican caucus, 25 senators plus one. Um, that would have guaranteed uh, his continuity in his position as leader of the Republicans. Um, when you listen to McConnell's speech that he made after the trial was over, it sounded like it had been written to explain a vote to convict. And then, you know, he said Donald Trump was singularly, factually, morally responsible for everything that took place on January 6th. He had a number of uh, very condemnatory statements that he made about uh, Trump that I was, you know, seated with the other impeachment managers and people were, you know, absolutely astonished at what he was saying. Everybody was saying he sounded like a member of the impeachment team uh, itself. But after going through all of that, he then went back and he hung his hat on the jurisdictional argument that we had disposed of on the very first day of the trial, where we considered the claim that the Senate did not have jurisdiction to try an impeachment of a president if the, that president had left office. In the meantime, there was no doubt that Donald Trump had been properly impeached by the House of Representatives for conduct undertaken while he was president um, and at a time when he was still president. But then he left office because you know they decided to conduct the trial later. So the claim was you can't try someone who uh, has left office. Unfortunately for him, that claim had been made repeatedly throughout American history and it had always been rejected by the Senate, going back to the very first Congress where there was an official um, impeached and convicted. Um, and this question was heavily adjudicated, if you will, in the Senate uh, in the Belknap case after the Civil War, where a corrupt Secretary of War who'd been taking bribes and kickbacks um, quickly resigned, submitted his resignation to Andrew Johnson, and yet the House said, well, we still have the authority to impeach him for crimes conduct, uh, conducted and committed while he was in office. And then the Senate said, of course, after debating this for two weeks, of course, we have the power to try all impeachments under Article 2, including those of, uh, of officials who have since left office. And if we didn't, it would mean anybody could just resign and escape accountability for the criminal actions they took in office. In any event, we dealt with that. We won on that question, 54 to 46, the very first day of the trial. And yet McConnell went back to that and hung his hat on this argument saying, so I'd love to convict him, but we can't because you know we don't have a jurisdiction over uh, the, the matter. And um, so that was one of you know several 
very weak technical arguments that were put out there to give people some cover for making an essentially political judgment. If you think about that uh, as an analogy to a criminal trial, Professor Bowman, your students will know that that's absolutely illegitimate. I mean, if somebody makes an argument in a murder case, you can't use this gun against me because it was seized in violation of the Fourth Amendment. And the person loses on that uh, on that argument. That's thrown out. Um, at that point, the constitutional argument is over. The trial proceeds on the facts and you can't go back to it. And if the jury goes back to it, that is an instance of jury nullification. And that's precisely what McConnell was doing. He was engaged in jury nullification. Of course, the ambiguity is that the senators have to operate both as judges and also as jurors. And so he simply conflated the roles uh, at that point. So um, let, let me... Um, let me just make you know two final points if I can, and if we could break for 60 seconds before questions, that would help me because my dogs are demanding to be let out and I'm all by myself here. But I, I wanna make a point about the, um, about the First Amendment. Um, and here I've got to um, uh, give a lot of praise to my constitutional law professor, Larry Tribe, who I've stayed in close touch with, who's been a great help. But um, you know, we, we had this ambiguity because they kept saying, well, under Brandenburg, he's not guilty. And, you know, I wanted to say under Brandenburg, he absolutely can be found guilty. He incited imminent lawless action in a way that was likely to produce imminent lawless action. And it happened and everybody could see it. So it's one of the rare cases where the Brandenburg standard is actually met. And yet I kept wanting to say that's the wrong standard for thinking about it because he's not just a guy in a crowd and he's not being criminally prosecuted. This has to do with the proper standards for presidential conduct and misconduct. This is about high crimes and misdemeanors and violation of the oath of office. Um, and so he doesn't even get the benefit of the Brandenburg standard, although we have no problem meeting that. Um, and then I called up Larry Tribe to start kicking it around and he kind of engaged in a Socratic dialogue with me. And he started saying, don't think of him as a guy who yells fire in a crowded theater. Think of him as the fire chief who sends the crowd to burn the theater down. And so I thought that that was a perfect way of making this point that you don't treat him like a, an arsonist in the crowd. You treat him like the fire chief who's supposed to be defending us against fire, who sends the mob to burn the theater down. And then when the calls start pouring in that there's a fire, does nothing but sit on his hands for three hours, watch it on TV and delight in all of the chaos. So I was very happy to have that breakthrough with my con law professor and uh, I was able to elaborate it with him. And I think that that metaphor became a central metaphor for understanding what uh, took place in the trial. Let me just say, finally, we ended up with a 57 to 43 vote. It was the most sweeping bipartisan vote in the history of presidential impeachments. As you know, uh, there've just been four trials in American history in the Senate of Presidents. Uh, Andrew Johnson, Bill Clinton, that one was ridiculous, Trump one and Trump two. This was by far the most sweeping bipartisan result. We ended up getting all the Democrats, seven Republicans from the from New England, from the Mid-Atlantic, from the Midwest, from the South, from the West, from Alaska. Uh, and yet, alas, we ended up 10 votes short. Um, Trump beat the constitutional spread. Um, as we like to say, there's never been a conviction of a president. I think that the framers probably understated the hold that partisanship would have on us. You know, if you go back and read the Federalist Papers, they really predicted that members of Congress would identify not with their political party, but with their branch of government or with their institution, with the House or with the Senate. And uh, if that were true, of course, the votes would have been 435 to zero and 100 to zero because his violent mob attacked us. We all could have died that day. Senator Lindsey Graham said they could have brought a bomb in because they avoided the metal detectors and there were 900 people in the building who had gone through no security screening at all. But we didn't identify with our branches uniformly. We identified far more with our political parties, which um, is a statement not necessarily about the flaws of our system, although we could talk about adjustments, but uh, something about human nature, uh, the human psyche and human cognition. 
Professor Bowman, I think I'll stop there. Can you give me 60 seconds to disappear? Of course, yeah, go, right. go deal with the dog. All right. There we go. Well, that was absolutely splendid. Since you've been kind enough to give us another 15 minutes or so, I do have uh, some questions that are coming in from some of those watching, particularly students. And I'm gonna ask some of those here in a second. I do have one, do have one question of my own, um, going to the, the composition, the drafting, the emphasis of the articles of impeachment um, uh, for the second. Trump impeachment. Um, I think it could be argued, and it was by some people at the time, that the emphasis, the heavy emphasis on the events of January the 6th, as, as opposed perhaps a, a greater emphasis on um, Trump's efforts to return the results of the election beginning the day after the election and running up to January the 6th. One could argue that constitutionally, maybe even evidentially, um, a better case might have been made by um, expanding the scope of the articles, although I recognize they were drafted in a way that allowed you to talk about that as well. Um, tactically or constitutionally, uh, why did you choose um, to focus as much as you did, uh, even if not exclusively, on the events of January 6th? Well, the first thing you got to remember is everybody was still in shock and in trauma uh, coming out of these events. Um, you know, there was there was a thick, putrid smell of tear gas and mace and all of these unknown chemical agents that the insurrectionists had brought like around the Capitol for uh, several days. There were people, many, many people wounded, many people uh, psychologically affected. And the effect of the insurrection and the attempt to coerce Mike Pence into rejecting electoral college votes uh, was powerful because we'd all lived through it. Um, and, uh, the, you know, Trump's efforts to browbeat and strong arm Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, for example, seemed to be far removed from us. Uh, people didn't really understand it and know it in the same way. People didn't have a sense of the whole sequence of activities of going to lots of election officials to try to intimidate them. People didn't really understand what Trump was up to uh, by going to the state legislatures to try to get them to uh, simply nullify the popular vote and substitute electoral college uh, slates uh, appointed to him. Um, and we had only a glimmer of an understanding at that point of what was taking place with the Department of Justice to try to overthrow his own leadership to install uh, Richard Clark uh, as um, the attorney general in order to falsely claim fraud and corruption. Um, you know, these assertions that had been rejected by more than 60 courts at that point. In other words, all of that seemed more abstract and some of it I emphasize some of it was on the legitimate side, like bringing all of those stupid cases in court. I mean, as absurd as it was and and as uh, problematic as it was for particular lawyers who basically um, attached their name to fraudulent cases like Rudy Giuliani, who's been suspended by the New York Bar. Still, there's the general idea, well, anybody can sue over anything in America, you know, um, and we're not going to constitutionalize Rule 11 sanctions against, you know, people like Donald Trump, who are just, you know, in addition to being a human crime wave, he's also a born litigator. He wants to, you know, get his army of lawyers to sue anybody over anything. But so the, we had to be careful about that. And so this just seemed to be at the in the final analysis, the greatest 
most vivid and egregious explosion of the illegitimacy of his plan to try to steal the election. And that's what it was. I mean, uh, you know, you send people in saying, stop the steal. They were going to try to block the legitimate counting of ballots. Um, and like other authoritarians around the world, like Putin and Orban, Donald Trump has learned the habit of um, bl blaming his opponents for doing precisely what he's about to do. So he says, stop the steal. That tells you he's about to steal the election in any way that he could. You know, and he was foreshadowing that for months uh, by saying, the only way I can lose this election is if they steal it. The only way I can lose this election is if there's fraud. I mean, it's hard to imagine a more anti-democratic, unconstitutional statement than that, that I, I will not accept any election that I don't win. I and mean, that's a fundamental breach of trust in a, in a constitutional democracy. So I guess the answer is we thought this was the worst episode. We could talk about everything leading up to it. The, the tactics of escalating illegitimacy and criminality leading up to January 6th, but it was the explosion of violence in coordination with the attempt to falsely deny Joe Biden his 306 votes in the Electoral College. I mean, and that was finally the plan. I mean, there were three rings of seditious activity. There was a mass demonstration, which turned into a violent mob riot against our officers. The middle ring was domestic violent extremists who were built into this insurrection ring of activity. Um, and this was the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers who've been charged already with uh, seditious insurrection. The, you know, the Proud Boys who were told at the first presidential debate by Trump to stand back and stand by. Um, the QAnon networks, the Unification Church, the Aryan Nations, the various militia groups, they all came ready to fight. Many had been engaged in paramilitary training. They were the frontline stormtroopers who smashed our windows, broke down our doors, and began the violence against our police officers. And then were the ones determined to get in to shut down the counting of electoral college votes in order to allow the other plan to proceed for Donald Trump. And because the, the inner ring, just to complete the thought, the inner ring of activity was the ring of the coup, which is a weird word in American political parlance because we don't have a lot of experience with coups in our own country. We think of a coup as something taking place against a president. This was a coup orchestrated by the president against the vice president and against the Congress. And all they wanted um, Mike Pence to do was to announce heretofore unknown extra constitutional powers of the vice president to nullify and reject and repudiate electoral college votes here from Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania, lowering Biden's total from 306 to below 270. And at that point, as you know, under the 12th Amendment, immediately the contest resolves into the House of Representatives for a so-called contingent election. And they knew that after the 2020 elections, they had 27 state delegations. We had 22. We have 22 state delegations. And Pennsylvania was split right down the middle. So even had they lost the at-large rep from Wyoming, uh, Liz Cheney, and she had defected, they still would have had 26 votes. And they would have run it just like the Republican National Convention at that point declared Donald Trump uh, the winner on the floor. And he likely would have invoked the Insurrection Act uh, to declare martial law and finally call in the National Guard to put down the insurrectionary chaos that he'd unleashed against us. Uh, a, a great explanation of, uh, of, of and what I assume to be largely the case, but it was delightful to hear you lay it out um, uh, so cogently. Um, let me try to see if we can finish, finish or fit in some questions from some students who won't get all of them. Um, so I'm picking some sort of uh, at random, but um, here is one from uh, Noel Mack. Um, can you speak more to the challenge of balancing the legal arguments throughout the impeachment trial with the recognition that many Americans saw the trial as a political move? How do you communicate the legal arguments to the public in a way that they would understand? Well, it's a great question. I mean, you, you could really teach a whole seminar about that problem because um, 
the political questions are legal questions. For example, do you use the Brandenburg standard or not? If you use the Brandenburg standard, uh, was the president inciting an imminent lawless action? Was he inciting this mob riot or not? I mean, the law and the politics are utterly intertwined. And that's the case with any impeachment trial. When you think about it, the, the jurors are the judges. The judges are the jurors. They get to decide on questions of evidentiary law. And we haven't even talked about evidence and witnesses. We'll have to do that some other time. Um, but um, look, at that I, the way that I tried to deal with that uh, was to go back to the framers of the Constitution to look at what was the constitutional design? Uh, why does Congress have the power to impeach the president and convict the president, but the president doesn't have the power to impeach us? What is the proper role of the president? The proper role of the president is to take care of the laws are faithfully executed. And if the president refuses to do that, if he violates his oath of office, if he's trampling the laws he's supposed to be faithfully executing, the constitutional design compels us to say, get rid of him, because no one person is that important. Congress is in Article One for a reason. We are the representatives of the people. I mean, in the Articles of Association and the Articles of Confederation, we didn't even have a president. That was added later to say, okay, we need somebody to faithfully execute the laws, but there are dozens and dozens of sections spelling out all the powers of Congress. There are four short sections about the president. And the fourth section is all about how you impeach a president for treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. So there's the expectation that a president will try to act like a king. And we're a nation conceived an insurgency against monarchical rule by one person who thinks he's better than everybody else. So I was trying to say, go back to common sense. Go back to Tom Paine. Use your common sense. You know, they were trying to make it like a criminal trial. They haven't proven beyond a reasonable doubt this or that or whatever. Well, of course we haven't because Donald Trump refuses to participate. He refuses to come out. And, you know, we, we sent him a letter saying, come on in and testify. He wouldn't do it. But that's not the standard. The standard is common sense. What standard do we need in order to protect the integrity of our constitutional design? And I told every Republican who came to talk to me, I said, you've got to do this for America. You've got to do this for our Constitution. But if you don't care about that stuff, you've got to do it for the Republican Party because he will destroy your party in the end. And I stick with that prediction that he will destroy Lincoln's party before it's all over. Here's another question. Um, oops, here, just a second. Um, from Betsy Smith, um, a law student here, uh, but sort of follows up on that, I think. What can we as future lawyers and members of the legal profession do to help achieve the goal of having all Americans from both parties become pro-democracy? And what does pro-democracy mean to you? That's awesome. Well, that's the right question we got to be asking. The first thing we got to remember is it's not both parties because there are millions of people who hate both of our parties, right? And so that's one way to get out of that whole kind of binary bipartisan uh, trap. We got to speak to the whole country. And I'm somebody who defends political parties and partisanship because I think the alternative to it is a one party state, you know, what the Orbans and the Putins and the Duterte's and the LCC's want to do. So people complain about partisan conflict and debate. Well, why do you complain about that? That's an expression of the First Amendment and it's an expression of human nature. So it is what it is. Like, let's grow up about that. But having said that, we can fight like cats and dogs in the election system before, you know, before everybody casts their ballots. And we can use the political parties to mobilize the vote, to get people out and to make sure that we have at least two parties, if not more, overseeing the vote, uh, something that's being challenged by the Trump people who are trying to put in one party administration of the elections. But, you know, the parties can work. And then we get elected. And once we're elected, we've got to remember where the word party comes from. The word party comes from the French word parti, which means also a part. Our party is just part of the whole. And when we get elected, we have to try to speak for the whole, not just for our major party, or, but also people who adhere to the other major party and the people who are in the minor parties and the people who are independents and don't believe in any of that. And so we know how to do that when we want to. If you come to my district office in Rockville, you got a problem with Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid or VA benefits or PPP, whatever it is, 
we go to work for you. All you have to show us is that you live in my district. But we never ask, are you Democrat or Republican, independent, whatever. We just say, are you one of my constituents? If you're a constituent, you look at that word etymologically, you're a member of me and my leadership as my constituent member. Like I have to serve you. That's the mentality we've got. In a democracy, those of us who aspire and attain a public office are nothing but the servants of the people. And the minute we think that we're a king and we're in it for private self-enrichment and we're going to boss people around and trample other people's rights, that's the moment we must evict, eject, reject, impeach, convict, and start over again. No one of us, even the greatest person in the country, much less the worst person in the country, is that important that we should elevate that person over the democratic system itself because our freedom depends on it. Because we, because dictatorship is always the pathway to destruction of people's freedom. Read Federalist Number 1 by Alexander Hamilton, who warned us of politicians who would act like demagogues pandering to the negative emotion of the crowd and then end up as tyrants trampling the liberties of the people. That's in the very first Federalist paper. And, you know, we sort of forgot ab about that lesson. So I guess I would say in answer to that very fine question, let's teach everybody about the history of our country, the struggles we've had to open our democracy up. Read all the 17 amendments we've had since the Bill of Rights as attempts to create a more perfect union with women's suffrage in the 19th Amendment and the 17th Amendment shifting the mode of election from the state legislatures to the people. The 15th Amendment ending race discrimination and voting. The 14th Amendment equal protection and due process. The 13th Amendment abolishing slavery and so on. All of these have been movements to vindicate the original values and principles that Jefferson put into the Declaration of Independence. And we know that that the experiment was deformed from the beginning because of slavery and because of the exclusion and subjugation of different groups. But the ideas were there of consent of the governed, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, of in unalienable rights of the people. And we have vindicated those ideals. We've concretized them for millions and millions of people. That is the dream of America. So we've got to teach people about our constitution and about the struggles we've had to make it real. We are um, at the end of the time you promised to give us. Uh, have you have you time for for one more question or not? Yeah, I'll be one or two minutes late for my next speech, so that's fine. Oh, well, I don't want. Well, in that case, I won't ask the question. Instead, I'll ask the other question okay. that the that the law review insisted that I ask, which is, can we see your dogs again? <laughs> uh, no, they're outside now. You're not going to be able to see. <laughs> no, tell, no, I'm happy to ask one more substantive question. I'll All right. My, 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 the last substantive question is, is sort of a variation of a couple of questions that have been asked. And it's basically this. You've articulated an expansive, uh, inspiring vision of democracy and the, of the necessity of defending it through impeachment. And yet it failed, at least formally, two efforts to impeach a man with whom I, and I think I would agree with you. You know, in my view, he is he's he, he's the demagogue of whom uh, the, about whom the, the, the framers worried. Um, he's the man for whom the impeachment provisions were in fact, in fact written. And yet, given the incredible power of particularly of the evidence you presented in the second uh, the second impeachment trial, the mechanism for ridding ourselves of of that malignancy absolutely failed. So, what if impeachment can't accomplish? Um, that. Uh, first of all, what hope is there for impeachment as a future mechanism? And second of all, uh, ought we be a little pessimistic about the future of our democracy? No, I mean, we, we convicted him in the court of public opinion. Uh, and I, you know, I have enough pride in our work and in the, um, the magnificent presentation of uh, the impeachment managers that I have no qualms about saying we convicted him in the court of public opinion. We convicted him in the eyes of history. We convicted him in the eyes of the world. And I think that he will increasingly be seen as a pariah in our public life at the same time that he exercises a, a near stranglehold over the GOP. It's become his party and it, it no longer operates like a, a modern political party. It operates much more 
like a, an authoritarian cult of personality, like a religious or uh, political cult. But I think there was tremendous value in what we did. Uh, we opened up um, the conversation to lead to, well, we had thought an appointment of an independent 9-11 commission, which at that point, both parties supported. It was Kevin McCarthy's idea to say, let's have five Republicans, five Democrats, equal subpoena power. We agreed to that. We essentially assented to everything that the GOP asked for. But after we had a deal, Donald Trump said no. Now, you, he's not the fourth branch of government or anything, but he had that kind of power over the GOP so that Kevin McCarthy pulled the plug on what they had advocated before. And so that's why we were forced to move to a select committee in the House, which all of the Republicans, other than Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, rejected at that point because they just said, we want to bury our heads in the sand. Can you imagine if there had been an attack by, you know, a revolutionary communist party that had uh, stormed the Capitol and postponed the counting of electoral college votes for four or five hours and there'd be no investigation or if Al-Qaeda or ISIS had done it? I mean, it's uh, it's just unfathomable that that would have happened. Uh, so, but th- th- that's that's to their disgrace. And the vast majority of the American people still want to know what happened and our select committee is going to deliver. Uh, and I think that the impeachment trial um, created a public record that we're building on now. And I think it, we did establish, you know, we have bicameral bipartisan majorities, both houses establishing as a legislative fact that Donald Trump incited the violent insurrection, even though he wasn't convicted um, and b- barred from holding office again, you know, that result could still be accomplished through the use of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, you know, which is worthy of another conference, Professor Bowman, because Section 3 of the 14th Amendment says you swear to uphold and defend the Constitution, and then you violate that oath of office by participating in an insurrection or rebellion against the Union. You can never hold office again at the federal or the state level. And the history of it is fascinating because when it came out of the House, the radical Republicans had written it far more broadly than that. It applied to anybody who participated in rebellion or insurrection, anybody who was part of the Confederacy. And it said, you can never vote again. It was disenfranchisement. So when it got over to the Senate, they said, no, let's just take the worst offenders, those people who actually held office and violated their oath, betrayed the country by participating in insurrection or rebellion. And even then, we're not going to disenfranchise them. We're just going to say, obviously, you can't hold office again. So look who's in that bullseye core of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment today. Clearly, Donald Trump is. There might be other people who are elected officials who participated in insurrection or rebellion. But we got to figure out, well, what's the mechanism? What's the apparatus for making that work today? Congressman, you have been absolutely splendid. Um, And we cannot thank you enough for for joining us and giving uh, this, this scintillating performance I learned so much. Uh, I know our our audience did. um, And we can only just thank you a thousand times. Thank you. Well, I thank you for inviting me. Hello to all my friends in uh, Missouri. I've never been out there, but one day I will come. Uh, When we get through the COVID nightmare, I'll come and meet everybody. Uh, But I admire your state a lot. Uh, And thank you for your leadership, Professor Bowman, and for all the editors of the Law Review. Thank you. Thank you.